Black Rifle Coffee, baby. Pretty cool. Woo! <laughs> the most important question of the day is why did you cut your hair? I know. That is a good question. <laughs> why did you cut your hair? <laughs> so when, when I retired from the Army, my late wife, Shannon, was like, don't get your hair cut for like two years. And I was like, that's the plan right there. So then I grew it out and it just stayed for a while. But then I figured if I was going to attempt to run for, for Congress, I should probably be a little bit more clean cut. I'm still torn on it. I don't know if it was the right decision. I, now, now I kind of think maybe I should have left it long. Yeah, I, I guess there's probably uh, a piece of that with that would be you have to be clean cut. Yeah. Clean shaven. Yeah. You know, because you, you want to get the, the what I would call is the uh, suburban soccer mom. Yeah. That, yeah. I, I think th there's a lot of folks who still who still associate people having like long hair and beards. scruff. Like, I can never grow in like a really prolific beard. It was always just kind of like this pointy thing and yeah. then like big sideburns that sort of overlapped. So I look kind of scruffy. But uh, I, yeah, I think a lot of people still associate that, that with your some kind of a crazy hippie or you're just not disciplined enough to get a haircut. I think... I think so. I think yeah. there's probably some residual from the 1960s. That, yeah. You know, I think that those 1960s and their rebellious nature, which I think is so interesting and which will flow into directly into our conversation where they're anti-establishment, right? If you think about the hippies in San Francisco, they're, you know, drop out, tune in. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like, uh, and they were all about fighting the establishment. Yeah. And now... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. who's fighting the establishment right. now right and now they're like you're a nazi if you don't have like 17 booster shots and like you're not wearing your mask still and if you're not ready to fund the next foreign war like you, you must be some kind of a radical like we need to we need to look at that guy yeah we need to look at the hey get this uh you know arm ukraine sign plus <laughs> right. you know defund the second amendment defund mm -hmm. the police get all this stuff in your yard and then make sure that you have a million boosters that yeah. makes you a hardcore liberal. Yeah, you're fighting the establishment there. Yeah, you're yeah, raging you're, against the machine. <laughs> you're raging yeah. against the machine. <laughs> I think it's funny, man. I think from the time that you 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 started. So what year did you join? I joined in 98. Okay. Yeah. So you came <clears> in. W w were you in uh, Range Battalion first? I was. Yeah, I went to, went to 275 first. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. you were 275 for how long? Just there for three years. So I was actually in uh, SFAS for 9-11. No way. Yeah, yeah. Because I thought like, hey, man, we're like, if there's any chance of getting to go to combat, it'll probably be special forces yeah. because we're probably not going to go to like a big war yeah. like ever again in my lifetime. So I was like, okay, I did my, did my time battalion. I'm going to go see what SF does because they're always kind of deployed throughout the world. Like that's what, that's, that's, that's the ticket. Yeah. Oh man. I, what, what, what do you think? I was, I was just thinking about this. I, I had this conversation earlier because I was doing this interview and they were asking me about basic training hmm. and I was like. They, and it was it was a legitimate question, right? Yeah. It's like, what are what are some of the things that you took away from your experience? And then they were like went through each phase or whatever. And I was like, bro, basic training stories are like the gayest things ever. <laughs> like, what? Well, don't don't force me to talk about this. Like, <laughs> everyone's gonna make fun of you if you make me talk about this. Everyone's gonna make fun of me. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what are you? Why don't you don't do up? this to me? Are you like teeing this thing up? <laughs> but then it, I, I I started to think about it. I was like, actually, yeah, I got a couple things. Yeah. I got a couple things. So I want you to go through and tell me, like, when you went in, what were the things you took away from that? Like like what I would say is because you're 11 Bravo, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Or yeah. You, I, you might have been like a hotel. No, I was 11 Bravo. Something. Yeah. <clears throat> so what were the things that you most definitively remember going like, fuck yeah, or like, whoa? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had wanted to go in the Army for so long. Um, like basically from the time I was whatever, nine or 10, when you can articulate what you want to be when you grow up, that by the time I got to basic training, I was like, finally, like I got issued camouflage. Yeah. How cool is that? I mean, like I, I ate it all up. So I, I just remember like, Hey, I, this is the start of what I've wanted to do my entire life. I think being a little bit more removed from it now though, um, it's hard to understand exactly what's taking place. But the way that they're basically taking people from all over America, which is massive, mm -hmm. you know, any yeah. other la um, land mass, it'd be multiple different countries. But we had people like I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, guys from the South, from the, you know, the Northeast and all that. They're taking people that were, you know, from the same culture, but very different and saying like, this is your new culture now. Right. Like you guys are all the same. You're all equally worthless. We're going to put you through the same amount of crap. And like, if you can do the work, 
then, you know, you're going to be praised. If you screw it up, then you're going to be probably ridiculed and have to do more work. And like uh, just the the way that they broke people down, like not in a negative way, because mm -hmm. it's basic training. It's not like super, super challenging. Right. If you go in, you know, decent mental fitness and decent physical fitness. But the way they said, hey, like your, your old you, don't worry about that anymore. Like this is your new tribe. This is your new way of life. I think that's pretty impressive, you know, to, yeah. to do in such a short period of time. Yeah, that's, that is interesting because I remember the first time coming out of northern Idaho, going down to Sand Hill. Yeah. And <laughs> Were you there the in the summer? Yeah. yeah okay, yeah, so yeah, I was too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Coming, coming from the Northwest, <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. What don't is people, this? Don't people die? I did, Yeah, I, I didn't understand humidity. I was no, like, I did this not is, either. This yeah. is not okay. Yeah. Well, this doesn't feel right. Yeah. And you, know, you start to get acclimated to it. But I also remember – the first time being up outside of like hunting or something like that, and like how those early morning PT sessions when yeah. the stars were out, you're we like, this is fucking pretty sick. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. It's cool, but you're you're still it's cool, but with the humidity, you're sweating through you're all still your sweating. clothes. Yeah. Um, and I remember thinking the same thing. I was like, these people are from everywhere. I'm from a you know Pacific Northwest too, so I'm like. I didn't understand half of what the fuck was going on. Yeah, exactly. It was, it was a little bit nuts. Yeah. Um, I actually didn't realize that I knew that there was like a little bit of like Southern draws and like yeah, a little yeah. bit of New York accent, yeah. but I didn't realize like heavy Southern draws and like heavy, like New England, Boston. Yeah. I didn't know those were real growing up in the Pacific Northwest because you just don't hear that. Mm -mm. And so I thought they were always exaggerations when you heard it, but then like – a guy that was my bunkmate, like he was from the deep south and I could barely understand him, you know. <laughs> yeah. And then like we had a drill sergeant that was from New York and I was like, is he screwing with us? Like, is he doing a character? It's like, that's that's the way he actually talks. I was like, oh, okay. That's so funny. <laughs> it's everybody, you know? Yeah, because yeah. We, we grew up basically in the same, well, I would say in the same 500 square or, or yeah. miles. So it's like, I thought everybody talked the same. same. I thought everybody yeah. spoke this, you know, fluent lower 48 English. Yeah. But then you go to... Georgia, Alabama, yep. New Orleans, you go to yeah. different places all around the United States and you're like, these are different accents yeah. based on the very specific region. Could be a city like New York to mm -hmm. your point or, or all these different areas. Yeah. And the first time I had things like grits, <laughs> yeah. I was like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> what, yeah. what is yeah. this? I've never seen this before. Yeah. I'm looking for oatmeal. Like, I, I know, <laughs> like, I know there's a possibility of us having this. And I remember the first time this, I was getting chow and um, this black lady was like, was she was like scooping a big plate <clears throat> of grits and she's like, oh baby, you need more of the, you need, like, she's like telling me I was skinny. <laughs> and, I was like, and I was like, this is the coolest shit ever. I want her, I want to be called baby everywhere I go. <laughs> As and a matter of fact, these things are delicious. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Give me more. Give me more. Yeah. And I was like, this is, this is pretty epic. I think the other things, I'm not trying to feed you. I'm just more of, of referencing uh, the organization, the structure of the army, the way that you learn things from crawl, walk, run, and the skill level one, we'll say. I And this is what I was talking about this morning. I was like, it was the first time I was exposed to actual, what I would say is um, OJT or uh, more of a, a, a direct training scenario where outside of like baseball or yeah. some sport where you're actually learning yeah. a more intellectual endeavor, but through physical form. So mm -hmm. seven dash eight still has to be digested and, right. then, and it has to be exemplified through physical act. Right. Yep. Well, but putting those two things together, you can't really do that at 18. I don't think you have the, the, mm -hmm. the cognitive ability, no. but later in life, I realized what, what they were doing. Yeah. Yeah. But it's cool to see that I mean, there's a lot of things the Army does very, very wrong, kind of stupid. <laughs> yeah. But like bringing people in and being like, hey, we're going to teach you everything from like how we wake up and do PT all the way to things that are more complicated. Like, you know, something that I say, you're learning to react to contact where there's some fire and there's some maneuver. And you're probably not thinking at, a, at that much of a – at that in depth of a level. But you are being taught to react, you know, like right. through repetition. It's like this is what we do when there's contact front and here's, here's how these different people act. Um, I, I just think it's pretty impressive. They could take somebody who was in high school months ago, screwing off with their friends yeah. to like, okay, we're going to give you a rifle and you and your buddy are going to be in a position where potentially you could shoot each other if it goes wrong. And right. then, I mean, for the guys who joined post 9-11, I mean, on the back end of that, it was like, and then we're going to send you to a unit and you're going to go to Iraq or Afghanistan and, and best of luck to you. Yeah. You know, like that's. 
pretty heavy stuff. Yeah, I. That's a different. I think it's there, there's a there's a shift within basic and AIT, and then ultimately those guys continuing on into Afghanistan or Iraq at the time, because I mean Iraq was kind of in full tilt. I would say oh three oh four right yeah oh five. Um, so did you go from how how long were you in regiment before you went to ranger school? Uh, oh, and just like six eight months. Oh, okay. So you're yeah. there. Yeah, same amount of time. And then, yeah, and then you were basically out to ranger school. So how long yeah. did you get recycled at all? Oh, of course. Yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I did uh, two derbies and two mountains. Oh, you did? I had a lot of fun there. Fuck yeah. yeah. yeah I liked it a lot. You had the extended I, stay. I got the extended stay. <laughs> yeah, shit. I did. I was a smart ass from ranger battalion. So, uh, you know, 19 years old, I knew everything. So, uh, yeah. But that's a good process too, man. It's the best leadership school. I mean, you really, there's nothing, nothing fancy about it. It's just they take people and they, break them down and you have to then lead them, which right. is a whole, which sounds easy until you're out there. And then you actually have to make decisions when everybody else is, you know, cold, wet, tired and doesn't want to listen to you. And yeah. And then instructors put you under stress and all that. But yeah. Yeah. I was, I was, I was actually thinking about that last night, which is weird because I was at the baggage rack at midnight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? And people were fucking angry. Yeah. At each other and like pushing each other out of the way to get their bags. It's it's like midnight. These yeah. people just came off a flight. Yeah. They probably slept, didn't sleep, but none of them are like, they haven't, they've all eaten, had pl yeah. I mean, plenty of opportunities for caloric intake in an airport. I mean, they're everywhere, right? Yeah. But uh, this thing was, I would say, yeah. you know, one misplaced bag yep. and there would have been a fist fight at the fucking luggage rack. Yeah. Like, at baggage claim. Oh, for sure. And, and you, you take us, and I was like, I just pulled the kids back a little bit. I was like, all right, let's, let's hang just, out. Let's, let's just hang out. Let's yeah. just wait. Like, obviously, people are really in a hurry. Like, have a little bit of patience, a little bit of discipline. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't need to jump in there and try to grab our bags. I see it. It's there. But right now, I I don't want to throw I don't want to throw hands at baggage claim, dude. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. A mid midnight fist fight at the baggage yeah. claim. Yeah. Yeah. But it's this little things where I think – Going through you know, what I would say is leadership schools like this where you're put through yeah. physical and mental exhaustion yep. and then you just understand little little pieces that you might yeah. not even be aware of. But. Yeah. It's a little bit a little bit of humanity you see, which I think in our society where I mean we're blessed to live in the society where like you basically would never have to experience any diff discomfort. Yeah. But then I think that's also kind of a burden too, because you get put in a situation where those creature comforts aren't there. Like you, if you've never tapped into that before, it's going to be all foreign. You're going to actually be a different person. So I, I do think there's a lot of value. That's why the military, obviously why the military yeah. does it. Like they, they want you to know who that person is inside of you when things are going sideways and you haven't slept in two days and, you know, haven't eaten whatever you want. And, yeah. You know. Do you remember points in your life? Can you think <clears throat> back to where you were pushed to that point where you're like, Man, I, I, I got to – how many times have you had to break through that wall mentally? How many times? <sighs> Man, I, I don't even know. Like, I mean, because there's – like, ranger school, it was a little little different because you're having to do that leadership thing. And, yeah. Um, I mean, there's definitely some hard evolutions in ranger school uh, or in ranger battalion. Um, but really, SFAS, too, is another one because mm -hmm. they were different because in ranger school, you're, you're in a squad, you're in a platoon, you're having to do a lot of leadership. And I think you can draw a lot of strength from, like – people are watching me, uh, yeah. you know, like th that some people will crash in that environment, but I think we're social creatures. So I think a lot more people rise to that occasion. But then like in SFAS, the way we select Green Berets for the most part, there's a team week, but then there's also, you're alone a lot mm. in the woods, you know? And so like I, the star course coming out of, uh, coming out of Ranger Battalion for me, I was like, wow, this is like the first time in the military where I've been alone or it's like, you know, I'm, I, it's not so much that I'm worried, can I carry the backpack and yeah. the distance? It's like, oh, okay, I'm alone. All the decisions are 100% completely on me. And so that was uh, that was definitely a moment where I was like, okay, you know, you, you can you can either figure this out or you can fail. You know, same thing, any kind of, you know, a, any selection process really where you're, where you're put on your own, you have to make individual decisions, I think is pretty, pretty foreign for a lot of military guys. Yeah, how, how many times have you been under the weight of a rucksack as you're grinding yourself into moon dust, like just <laughs> one more step. <laughs> one more step. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. I don't know how long this thing's going to last for, yeah. but like if I make it to that tree or if I do like two more steps or, 
you know, are we doing this again tomorrow? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like is this the last one? Yeah. You know, like I think I think that uncertainty too that that uh, yeah. that really messes up a lot of people. And I think it's good they put us in those situations because when you're down down range or you're somewhere in combat, it's like you don't know. You don't know. You don't actually know what's going to happen next. And so you've got to. It's cliche to say, but you've got to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah, it, that's. The, I think that's such an important point where understanding that you have to embrace embrace the unknown. Yeah. You have to prepare, prepare for the worst, hope for the best. You have to work through multiple different planning scenarios. But yeah. at the end of the day, you have to have a bunch of skills that make mm -hmm. you really agile so you can pivot in those circumstances. Yeah. Uh, I think that probably, I mean, for, for a guy, I don't know. I obviously have known you for a long time, but it's like, do you get um, disappointed with the lack of discipline that you see just kind of being represented everywhere. Yeah. I mean, I, I it's just weird because I, sometimes I feel like um, coming out of our community into the real world mm -hmm. and, and you've been in the real world longer than me, it's a, it's a rough transition. And it's also almost like it's completely different cultures. And so yeah. sometimes, you know, it's easy to feel like a little bit foreign. And I'm not saying like because we're better than everybody else, but it's just very, very different. You yeah. know, like the, the lifestyle that we lived for the past two plus decades with a small tribe of people that were very much like us. And then to get kind of put back out, you know, into the world, it, it is weird. And so it, it, I, I do I do find it a bit discouraging at times to see how many Americans have, you know, like they – they lack discipline, you know, in their personal lives, obviously, mm -hmm. when you see them and they're morbidly obese, like they're doing that to themselves, but they're, it's also a detriment to all of society. Uh, but that's just the cosmetic. But then you, you also see just a lot of people who they don't care, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not saying they need to politically align with me, but like they don't show up. They don't vote. We just had municipal elections in, in Washington, the non-sexy ones, so city council, school yeah. board, yeah, but, yeah. but the stuff that really is important affects your daily life. We had 17% of registered voters turn out and vote. 17%. 17%. Yeah, which, I mean, I was looking at the numbers, and that's kind of average for yeah. municipal elections. Um, so it, it's just like, man, and nobody's got any excuse. Like, we mail people the ballots, which is a whole different story. But it's just people who who see, oh, I can pick my government. I'm really not interested in doing that. <laughs> like, do, guys, do you realize how big of a blessing it is, you know, that we actually have these rights here in this country? And they will be taken away from you if you don't exercise them. And so that, that to me, when I just see that, uh, I guess it's complacency maybe mm -hmm. or just kind of a lack of respect for what it took to build the country, um, that can be discouraging. I, I feel like in, in some small pockets we're turning some of that around, but that uh, – that's definitely been a big wake-up call for me. Yeah, it's almost it, it's almost as if we need to um, treat people like spoiled <clears throat> children at a certain point, where we take away their toys and then give them back to them so they can appreciate it. It's like <laughs> I, th I think that might be coming. Like <laughs> it, it feels like that might be coming. You know, with yeah. the way everything's going, and you know, people are not prepared for that. I think I, I think the COVID, the, whatever that year, I was thinking about it. It, it, it almost accelerated our ability to look at people and understand how incompetent, um, naive and maybe yeah. stupid and yeah. for just, I mean, when I say that stupidity, I think is classified as lack of experience and intellect. So you, you can't just say stupidity is a low IQ because you can yeah. overcome a low IQ with just hard work. So 100%. It, it, stupidity is, is what I would say is a combination of, of, of three things, which is a, a low IQ, uh, a lack of, 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 desire discipline in order yeah. to go and in, in, increase your your circumstance and then a lack of experience so like i i like to say that because it's it's like some people confuse stupidity with just a general like no i, I know a lot of stupid guys that bust their ass <laughs> yeah and they're fucking exceptional yeah. human beings and how many like borderline geniuses do you know that have never accomplished anything yeah. like because you know like literally there's a too smart to tie their own shoes. Or I know guys who are, you know, probably literal geniuses, but like they just don't have any driver initiative or discipline. No. You know, and it's like, man, I'll, I'll take the guy who's an average IQ or maybe even <laughs> slightly below average IQ who's willing to put in the work over like the guy who's going to tell me how smart he is because of a test he took or a degree right. he has or something like that. It's like, okay, well, but what, what do you actually have the drive to, to do every single day, especially when things get hard? Yeah. Well, when things get really hard, that's when you know people. Right, like that. That's actually when when you start to yeah. truly understand who people are. Yep. When things get really nasty. Yeah. Then you can go. 
oh, okay, I know who I am. Yeah. Which is like one of the things I, I, I truly love about the one of the things I love about my, what my wartime experience is like, hey, I know a couple of things about myself. Yeah. That gives me the confidence and the character to keep going. Whereas like if I would have questioned some of the things that I had done yeah. or had yeah. some questions, I think it would make it a much more difficult ever. But like I know like but knowing you're not a coward is a pretty fucking powerful thing. It is. Like it's yeah. It just allows you to step into the day and go, eh. Okay. It's going to be okay. All right. We'll, we'll buff out. <laughs> yeah, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Someone might say, someone might say something mean to yeah, me, you know, yeah. but like, I don't know. Yeah. At the end you of the day, it's like, uh, it's it's a very powerful. And it I, is. I was actually talking to my wife about this because one of the things that I love about uh, martial arts, which is a broad mm -hmm. departure from where we're talking about, but we'll come back to it, is building confidence within kids to defend themselves oh, yeah. so they can go out in the world yeah. and- if they need to, they can fuck people up. Yep. Not intentionally. Not intentionally, right. But they have to be able to defend themselves, which gives them more confidence yeah. to engage yep. in a wide spectrum of activities across the world. Yeah. So I know if I'm in remote, you know, El Salvador or wherever the fuck it is, based on my life experience and kind of the the the, the tools in the kit bag, I'll figure it out. Yeah. And that's one of the things that 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 obviously the military and the, the couple wars that we were participating in <laughs> gave me. So like kind of going back to you, which is like, we both talked a little bit about how much we, we have, we have this level of disdain for the, the, the deciders <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> going into Iraq. <laughs> I mean, for so many different reasons. Yeah. But did you take anything positive away from it? Like, like we, we, we'll talk, we can talk about sure. all the fucking yeah, yeah. negative things, but I what mean, did you take away from it from a positive perspective? Yeah, it's weird because I'll have people that will say, hey, um, especially being on the, like the campaign trail, like I'm confused. You're, you're very like anti-war and you'll make fun of the military industrial complex and you'll say, here's how we need to dismantle it. You know, but like you talk about being a Green Beret a lot. Like, yeah. And it seems like you have a lot of pride. Like you'll post a, you know, a picture of you in uniform or like well, what what gives. And for me, it's like almost two different galaxies that we like coexisted in at the yes. same time. Because like how I feel about what war gave me, um, I, I, I see the thing is I'd, I'd go back and do it all over again. Like I now I know everything was pretty much bullshit and we were getting played. But and this maybe this is selfish. I would go back in a heartbeat because I, I still am of the mindset, like if your country's going to go to war and you're an able-bodied young man, like that's your duty. Uh, go contribute in some way, shape or form. And for me, as a little boy, I wanted to be the guy that was on the, the tip of the spear and then I got to go do it and I did it. And so that, that gave me, like you said, an amazing amount of just confidence. And it's, it's one thing to, you know, have a, a goal or a dream or whatever. It's another thing to actually go accomplish it. And I think that does give you a lot of power and a lot of confidence. Uh, mm -hmm. And then just the experiences I had with my friends, you know, with guys that became basically like brothers to me. You know? yeah. It's just like, and I'm proud of what we accomplished. If you mm -hmm. look at, for lack of a better term, the shit sandwiches that we were handed, yeah. you know, and it's like, and then we made this our world. We were successful, like our tactical missions. I feel good about all of that. Now, like you said, the, the, the people who, who lied through their teeth to get us into those wars so they could drain the coffers of our country, of our, our blood and treasure, like I have nothing but contempt and disdain from them. Mm -hmm. And I feel a, a duty and obligation as a veteran of those wars to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, I think the way that our Vietnam veterans were treated, I think had that treatment been different when they came home, I think a lot of those guys probably would have stayed like in the government apparatus. Right. And they probably would have said like, hey, this Iraq war thing's not checking out. Like we've seen this movie before. But I think those guys got crapped on so heavily when they came home that most of them just checked out. Completely. Like they went, they went back about their lives. You know, most of them were good Americans who just didn't talk about the war anymore. They went on, they lived their lives, but they didn't stay in a place where they could make a decision. When you get a guy like Dick Cheney, who's never had a scrap of dirt underneath a fingernail, mm -hmm. let alone fought in a war, come and say, Hey, I got this hot new idea for a country we need to invade. You know, the, you probably would have had some veterans say like, I think you're full of shit because of what happened, you know, in v just pattern recognition. Yeah. But we didn't have that. That was all drained away. So for me, I, I mean, the experiences I had in, in combat made me who I am today, and I wouldn't trade them, the good, the bad, the ugly, for anything, you know. But it also gives me fuel for the fire to stay in the fight to make sure that this crap doesn't happen again. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's an interesting balance that we have to put. Yeah. Which is you and I share a lot of very specific views on this, which is I wouldn't trade the actual time. Yeah. 
but I also flushed four and a half years of my life down the fucking mm -hmm. drain in Iraq, right? So I have a, when I say that, it, it's it's actually a little bit flippant more so than than it actually than it actually is. I don't truly feel that way, but I am pretty fucking pissed off. Yeah. Um, you know, we popped the cap on it. Were you were you in the invasion of Iraq? Right after. So right I, was after. In, I was in the Q course. Were you course. in fifth grade? Or we're at fifth grade. Were you in, were <laughs> I, was in fifth, I was in fifth grade, yeah. So you came in, what, 04 then? 03. 03, so, so summer, you came in. So I thought, like, I thought we missed the push in yeah, Afghanistan because yeah. yeah, yeah. I was in selection for 9-11 mm -hmm. and 275 got kind of carved out of that. Right. Went to the Q course and I'm in language school. Pashtu language, of course. Fuck yeah. Um, and then we invade Iraq. And I'm like, well, I just missed both the wars yeah. of my generation. You're done. I'm done. I get the fifth group. And they're like, pack your shit. We're, I mean, I don't know what they knew at the time. But like my team sergeant was like, this is not going to be done anytime no. soon. He's like, this is not going <laughs> no. away. I was like, oh, really? Oh, that's that's good news to me. So I was back over there. Me and Josh Roshan were back over there uh, August of 03. So August 03. Where were you guys at? Baghdad. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you were in Baghdad. Yeah. Yeah. So that's when things started. So I, I I was going out when you were coming in. Yeah. So I could see, and it was so interesting from, you know, watching the news and, and being in Najaf in our team room and yeah. then watching Rumsfeld talk about, well, there's a bunch of band and looters. And we're like, dude, this is not baseline criminals. Like this is a pregnant pause. This is exactly what I, this is exactly what I said. Yep. It's like, this is a pregnant pause. <laughs> in a long, large-scale insurgency. The other thing that we knew was like Iranian, <clears throat> the Iranians were, were were in this fucking country like right away. Oh, yeah. Like, like, yeah. So. Especially down south. like Najaf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah Najaf. I mean, we, 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 so the cleric with Muqtada al-Sadr actually had the, the warrant for his arrest. Mm -hmm. I was in that riot. So we were installing a cleric from, from the UK that we yep. had flown in. Yep. I had met Muqtad al Sadr. Yeah. So I, we're we're with uh, Fifth and OGA. Yeah. So we had all met with Muqtad al Sadr like two or three days before that. He was like, as you can imagine, a piece of shit. And we were sitting there, and so we got you know, the CIA guys, case officer X, and we got the group guys on one side, and we're all going, we got to go kill this fucking guy. <laughs> He's a piece of shit. Right. He is going to. If you think for one second he's going to work with us yeah. over his handlers in Iran, mm -hmm. you have lost your mind. The CIA case officer at the time, who is also uh, a doctorate in Middle Eastern studies from oh, Georgetown, boy. because he knows everything oh, fucking boy. Middle Eastern. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, no, he's going to work with us. We're, I mean, all the knuckle draggers knew exactly who this guy was and knew exactly what yeah. needed to happen. There was no chance in hell they were going to let us kill him. And so we we were sitting there going like, dude, we can go kill this guy. He had 43 guys. I remember the exact fucking number on yeah. his compound. He had 43 guys on his compound just outside of fucking Ajaf. We could have gone in there. Yeah. And then how many years later were we going into the, the, the Sodder uh, City? Sodder City. Mara, yeah, yeah. Bro. Yeah. So we couldn't touch him. Mm -hmm. So you're you're – you're coming in as I'm going out. I'm yeah. watching this on the news. I'm watching Rumsfeld going, this guy, is he doesn't know what the fuck is going on. Nope. He didn't know anything. Now it's starting to warm up because in, in August, yeah. that's when things started to really ramp up for you guys. Yeah, I, we got there um, right after the UN headquarters got bombed. Uh -huh. This is our Cowie's debut. Yep. Blew up the UN. Uh, the two teams that we replaced, 595 and 585, went out after the UN bombers. And that's when uh, Bill Bennett and Kevin Moorhead got killed yep. uh, on that hit. And so, like, we came in. Most of that team got medevaced out. The captain and, like, two other guys stayed. They had they had wounds because it was a – basically, they it was a barricaded shooter. But, like, they knew that the team was coming in. And so they basically just put guys in there to fight and die in entrenched positions. So yeah, we, yeah, I remember. I remember very specifically that because that was like yeah. the first time that we saw barricaded yeah. suicide. They weren't playing. They weren't playing. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was definitely the A team. Yeah, like it was Arkawi's guys. Yeah, yeah. So that we we got there and like <laughs> literally for handoff, they're like scrubbing blood out of the Tacomas, you know. And I was like, oh, we're we're here. We're in combat. Like, yeah, this is the real deal. Yeah. 
And so then we did, we were really fortunate. My, uh, my team and another team got combined to make a full team because everybody was short at the time. For whatever reason, the SIF company, uh, under the control of the CENTCOM commander, got left like in Djibouti. Oh, I remember. And so yeah. we became like the direct action element. And so we did three months of just kicking indoors and chasing down the uh, deck of card guys and going after Zarqawi's guys. So, and then <clears throat> at, like right around the fall, we got transitioned to a much more traditional SF mission. They were like, hey, you guys are going to stand up the, the new Iraqi army and the Iraqi right. special forces. And so we took a bunch of the former Saddam militias and like tried to demobilize them and make them into what became the 36 commandos and then ISOF. But I had a moment similar to that when we were, because I had just been kicking indoors. And so I really wasn't thinking like big picture. I was actually just happy to be in combat. Yeah. But when we started training up the, uh, the militias to make them into the Iraqi special forces, we had a bunch of guys that were from Saddam's military that wanted to come back into the military. And this is right when Bremer did the whole debathification thing. Oh, I remember. And basically, yeah, they were like, well, if they had anything to do with the former government, you got to fire them. And like all of us and my, my team leader at the time, you know, a whatever, 26-year-old captain, he's like, this is freaking stupid. Very. So he's like, can you imagine if we just like fired – if we got home back to Fort Campbell and they were like, you guys are all fired – like, I mean, and, and so all of us down at the, at the ground level were like, I know, I know he was sending up star clusters in the, in the sit reps and all that. And it just, sure enough, it was like, you can't hire anybody. And the next thing you know, we're getting all these guys who I, we, we could tell were directly working for Iran. It was like, these guys had identification cards yes. from the Supreme Council for Islamic Revolution. Yes. And I, you know, we're looking this stuff up and I'm like, this is a terrible idea. Not, we just created an insurgency and then we just brought in all these guys that are literally Iranian proxies. And thank God, the only reason I don't, I think we didn't get green on blue killed was because we had enough Kurds there that like had a vested interest in making sure that we were safe. So for those of you that are having a hard time following this, <laughs> <a lot> of, <laughs> <right>? because <laughs> Joe and I are giving you basically a, 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 a history lesson on the Iraq war from like start to finish. So yeah. you've got, You've got essentially, if you, if you if you divide it into three main groups, the the southern Iraq, we'll call it like Basra up to about Najaf, and then into Baghdad, you've got Shia, Sunnis are more out west, and then you've got Kurds up north. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So Kurds had been aligned with us, even though we kind of fucked them over in the 90s. They had been aligned with us for a longer period of time. They were yeah. actually extremely efficient war fighters. They yeah. were very dedicated. Warrior culture. Very yeah. warrior culture. The Sunnis is where the Ba'ath party essentially reside within. It was part of Saddam's tribe and it was uh, – the, they had the lion's share of the control for the multiple decades leading into that. They were also some of the more proficient war fighters as well. <laughs> so we were aligning ourselves with what I would say is the less mm -hmm. aligned – and then tribal affiliated, and more more importantly, Iran affiliated, yeah, uh, and and backed Big guys. Time. So this was almost the guys that were watching, and we were participating in this. This was almost a play by play as to how to create an insurgency. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. It, it was. It was like how do you create a, yeah. an insurgency? And yeah. we're, I remember I fucking threw a coffee cup at the fucking TV when that debathification was. <laughs> I was like, this is so fucking stupid. Can you imagine if we went into Germany? <laughs> right. And, and this is the conversation yeah. that we are yes, having. Yes. We're like, we went in Germany and we're like, we can't do business now with anybody that was affiliated with the Nazi party. Yeah. We would have been fucked. Yeah. Like hardcore T at the end. Yeah. Screwed. I mean, yeah. A big part of rebuilding Europe was bringing, I mean, obviously they still prosecuted the war criminals, the of guys course. that run the camps and all that. But like the people that were just part of the Nazi party, they brought back into government, you know? And so it's like... It, Anybody of any kind of common sense could see this at the ground level. And so I, I don't know. I, at the time, just being a 23-year-old, still E5, almost an E6, yeah. I was like, you know, maybe like what we're saying, maybe someone back in D.C. that's smarter than us, maybe they know better. Certainly someone has a plan, you know. And then I eventually, as the years and the insurgency went on, I was like, well, maybe they're just not listening. Maybe they're not getting ground truth. And then, you know, more years go by and I'm like, oh, they just don't give a shit. They're all making money off this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it like took me a little bit to get there. It but, took me a long time to get there too yeah. because I used to think the same thing. I, I, I had quite a bit of faith in decision yeah. makers thinking these guys actually knew more than I did. Yes. And they were putting together a much bigger plan that exactly. was of strategic importance that I couldn't understand from the tactical level. Yeah. So, so my, do, job, is my, to, job. my yeah. job is to execute on tactics, not to think about what I would say is like strategic and policy. Yeah. And – but as the years ticked on – Yeah. 
and it it got worse yeah. because it, it didn't get better. No. It got fucking worse. I mean, still. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, still. Yeah, still shit show. Yeah, shit show. Still a shit show. Yeah. And, uh, but it took me years. Like, I actually didn't fully understand it. I was in Basra in the sofa. So, it, it okay. Was, yeah. So I was in. I was, up, I was up in Baghdad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I was in Mosul when the sofa first hit, and then uh, Baghdad for the withdrawal. Okay, yeah. yeah. So I was sitting in Basra watching. You know, I, I believe it's like the eighty second or one hundred first, right? Like they were, you know, pulling their vehicles out and driving south. Yeah, and and thinking, what in the fuck <laughs> did we do here? Right. Exactly. Right? Like, what did we do here? Yeah. And it was like a gut punch, and it was it was so interesting because. I was, I walked out into this field and it was a field of those, do you remember those Cummins generators that looked like a shipping container? They're oh, yeah. so big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a field of them, like a yeah. hundred of them. And these are like a half a million dollars I was going to say, what are they, yeah, half a million. They're like a half got, a million bucks a piece. Yeah. And when they would run out of diesel, they would just park them and then get another one. Like, what, how does this make sense yeah. in any way, shape or form? And just kind of like crunching numbers, you know, like, okay, like who's so. Who's got the contract for this? Yeah, hmm. who, who's, who's doing this? And then yeah. where's the motivation? It didn't fully sink in until I went to Afghanistan right after that. And then I was like, we were, we were I, I, I read this report where they're talking about, it was, it was like $30 million a month fell off a truck from meaning like disappeared from the budget, essentially, like a yeah. loss of accountability yeah. from Pakistan to Afghanistan yeah. every fucking month. That's just, a, that's the Pentagon accounting area, right? That's <laughs> yeah. just like Man. budget dust. Yeah. And I'm like, the education <clears throat> system, you know, in, in, in my, you know, in my home state of Idaho, what they could do with oh my God. $30 million a year, just a year. If you're like, take one month and say, I'm, we're going to reallocate this. I'm yeah. like, oh my gosh, man. Yeah. Yeah, as opposed to maybe funding more potential terrorists or just like the the graft of the war zone. Right. Invest it in the school district, invest it in roads, infrastructure. Like imagine how better off we'd be. I don't know, Flint, Michigan comes to mind. Right. You know, like we, we've like got- Like American a, internal manufacturing, yeah, and small business small, support. Right, like you need right. It, There's right. just, I don't know, something for Americans for God's sake. Yeah. You know, like, but yeah, I mean, I had similar moments too. I, I just remember being really a little confused. Um, like 03, 04, I, I thought that our mission was to go in there- you know, get Saddam, find the WMDs, like kind of get in, get yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. And especially after they caught Saddam, you know, like, cause I was there when yeah. I was, I wasn't on the mission or anything, but we were in theater then in country. And I was like, okay, well, so we got Saddam check. Like they're looking for the WMDs. That seems a bit fishy at this point. Yeah. We've installed the new government. Why is everybody building new bases? I just remember thinking that I was like, why are they bringing more big army dudes in? Like we kind of got it done, you know? And then you know, the, the years wear on. I'm like, oh, we're always building new bases. This right. this kind of is, this is the reoccurring payment that uh, that contractors are able to get. But I just remember having that moment as, you know, again, a young staff sergeant. I was like, I thought we were like here to have a light footprint to eventually hand, because we kept talking like in 04, they're like, we're going to hand over the government to, yeah. of Iraq in 2004. And I was yeah. like, well, okay, we got Saddam. We created a new government. Maybe it's not perfect. Maybe we screwed some things up. Why are we bringing more dudes and more stuff here? Like I just, it took me, it took me another deployment or so to like kind of put that together and be like, oh, we're, we're constantly going to be expanding our footprint here. It, it, it's, it's pretty interesting because as a warfighter, especially from a, from an unconventional perspective, when you're looking at those things, you're like, it wasn't as if I was against, uh, uh, uh what I would say is a, a, an international prosecution of terrorists. Like, that's not what I was right. saying. I was saying, no, there needs to be some type of guerrilla warfare footprint specifically to eradicate terrorism. Mm -hmm. I, I 100 percent align with that. I believe in, in unconventional warfare as far as force, mul force multiplying effect. I also think that we get a better bang for our dollar. Much and better. I also think that we get accountability directly on the ground with the indigenous force and mm -hmm. the, the government. Yeah. I don't believe in large scale wars of occupation and conventional military. I think that's, from my perspective, this is just one man's opinion. It starts to turn into an exercise of a transference of wealth mm -hmm. from the American taxpayer into yeah. 
the military industrial complex. Yeah. I, th- I think an interesting uh, way, way – this is the way I look at it now. Like the initial push into like, Afghanistan when we took down the Taliban, yeah. that was like a handful of ODAs. You know, they had they had yeah. JTACs with them from the Air Force. We had some air cover. CIA paramilitary had done their, their homework ahead of time. But it was a relatively light footprint and they got it done. But the crazy thing is like – there's no money in that. Can you imagine what no. – from, from the time that we put boots on the ground in Afghanistan at the time, the Taliban fell and we had bin Laden and Zawahiri on the run, how much money we had spent. It was probably a drop in the bucket. And I think you had a lot of defense contractors who were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. If this whoa. is a war the American people are all in, we're not just going to squeeze this tiny couple – what, it's a couple million dollars probably. It's probably yeah. nothing. Probably half a billion maybe at the most. Yeah. That's, the, that's not it. That can't be it. We can't just chase bin Laden. Are you kidding me? We're going to build a government in Afghanistan. And then the next thing you know, you've got big army, which is not ran by special operators. It's ran by you know armored tank division commanders who eventually become generals. They're like, hey – Iraq, baby. <laughs> like, look at that. We can do us a proper invasion, not this guys on horseback thing. Right. Like, we can we can roll in tanks and, you know, combine maneuver warfare. Like, that's the ticket. And then they get there and, you know, the contractors, it's just, hey, let's expand. Let's build some more bases. Like, everybody gets paid. There's no money whatsoever in doing very deliberate, targeted intelligence operations and maybe – some special operations here and there. Like there's just no money in that. No. That's, that's, that's the way I see it right now. Yeah. Like, it's interesting that you and I were having almost the same emotional and intellectual <laughs> yeah. progress as we're moving through this. By the time that like I would say 2014, like I was fully divested of any large scale occupation. I was like, yeah. this is, this is work. complete, doesn't work. Well, I, you know, I mean, there are multiple different examples I think, you know, to go back to do not talk necessarily about the, the politics involved in it, but the actual war fighting element, uh, like what, what was the first, the, the first engagement for you? Because I mean, obviously you built this up, you were in Ranger Regiment before yeah. you went SF and now the first time you guys take fire or, you know, or, or, or give it. Yeah. What's that? What's that like? You know, I was really – like my first deployment, like we did a ton of kinetic operations and we were definitely giving it more than we were taking yeah, it. We took, we took some fire here and there. We hit some really rudimentary like IEDs. But this is way before EFPs or before even the Sunni militants really figured it out. So they were still just kind of blowing up and kicking dirt in places. And so it was like, ooh, a little scary. And then you're like, what? I didn't even – okay. All right. Yeah, all right. Yeah, that yeah. was – all right. Cool. Um, so that was really the – the first rotation, but going out and doing, you know, kinetic direct action where it's like, hey, capture, kill. Like the first time you get one of first, those. Your first target. First time you get one Walk of those. Walk me through your first target. Yeah, yeah. So actually on the back of a Toyota Tacoma. I mean, pretty sweet, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, our first one, we went actually into Sadr City before Sadr City got super hot. Um, there was, I, th- I think he was a former, I don't even remember what the target was. It was some former bath guy right. on the outskirts of Sadr City. And we basically just gaffed out there uh, in a handful of Toyota Tacomas. You know, we did the whole over the wall thing, uh, breached his gate, breached his door. Josh Rosen put a freaking half block of C4 <laughs> on, the on the gate. The, on the, <laughs> on, we, we, we climbed over the gate and then we got the uh, got the breach of like a like half block or a quarter block. It just you just a whole freaking chunk of C4. <laughs> you P nuke. for plenty. Because we had like we had some like intel and it's like it looks like a pretty beefy door. And Josh is like, all right, P for plenty. Like we're doing it, baby. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, for that first you know breach where you're really like cacking it off. You're yeah. like, you don't know who's on the other side. I mean, we, this is before most of our tactics were burned. So the fact yeah. that we, we drove in there in relatively uh, low profile vehicles. So we beat all the early warning yeah. because this is before they were looking for guys into, you know, Tacomas right. like they were years later. Um, but yeah, definitely exciting. I like all I really like the, if I go through that raid, in my head, I remember going up to the breach point. I remember riding on the back of the, the Tacoma. And I'm like, man, I better not fall off this thing because that would be like a horrible first combat operation. <laughs> like, I, I got to fall off the back of the truck going like 70 miles per hour. Yeah. Like, I, what'd you do in the board, Dad? Well, I fell off the back I of the Toyota. back of the truck. <laughs> but, but it was a really sweet mission, I promise. But uh, I remember thinking that. But then from the time the breach went off, I literally just remember seeing like smoke and chaos. And I remember in detail clearing the room. And I can still like see the red dot on my gun, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. It was just that jacked up. And I think I was just probably looking at my sectors of fire. You know, later on, you you develop much more situational awareness. But I, I do remember that. My team sergeant had 
ton more experience. He had been in, you know, the first desert storm. He had been in the ground war in Afghanistan and Iraq. And so I just remember later looking at him on like a couple targets later and I was like, oh, he is not jacked up at all. Like he, yeah. he is cool, calm, collect. I want to be like that. I don't want to be like super tense. But yeah, the, definitely the first couple, man, just going outside the wire, the the pucker factor. But then again, still, I mean, I was just like, I can't believe I'm actually in combat. This is this is awesome. Yeah, I I, I dumped I dumped I was number one, and the breach went off, and I dumped my mag because I was riding my fucking oh, index yeah. finger over a fucking mag release. <clears throat> yeah, and when it, it was a reflex to the fucking yeah to the breach. Never done it before. Yeah, but that's how jacked up I was. So I got up on the top of the roof, yeah. the first target. And I and I had two guys on the top of the roof, and I looked down. And I didn't have a fucking mag in my rifle. <laughs> I was like, "That is a that is a mistake you never make twice until right. you're <laughs> yeah, exactly. always like, the, but yeah, yeah, I was so fucked up. Like yeah. it's the same thing. Like I remember, you know, crossing the threshold, first room, second room, stairs, you know, and. I also remember every SOP that we'd fucking train for. I was like fucked, like out the window, like, out the fucking window. I was yeah. fucking running through looking for targets. Right? It's yeah. So stupid. Yeah. And, but that was like how fucking ramped up. Like, oh yeah, just how ramped up you are. And then, like, fast forward, like the last the last thing I did, I think I put a mag in my back pocket and my jeans, and I was like, well, let's go. <laughs> yeah, we'll I, had, I had like out. a frag and a fucking mag in my back pocket. It's like, yeah, yeah we just need two mags. This is a two mag. This is a two mag thing. I, I don't need. I don't need more than this. There's some in the truck. We'll be okay. Yeah, yeah. I had like twelve. <laughs> you remember? You remember original loadouts? Oh yeah, dude. Oh yeah. How much shit were you carrying? Do you oh, remember? Oh, I do. I got pictures of it too. Like, uh, I think because we we just assumed that every direct action mission was going to be. Black Hawk Down. It was going to yeah, be a moment yeah. issue. That yeah, was yeah. that was what you. Same thing when I was in Ranger Battalion. That was that was the training. So I got to group. We're doing you know DA. So I'm like, all right, cool. I'm taking. I mean, I think I probably had like 12 mags. Yeah, like, mo- like that least, was the loadout. 12 at least mags, four frags, and then of course, like my favorite is like I had probably like five pistol mags. You yeah, know, just in case like I had ran through all my other mags, I was going to be alive long <laughs> enough to go like just just crazy, you know. And a shotgun with like I don't know a couple dozen shot- shotgun shells it's in case I needed to shotgun the entire block <laughs> of, <laughs> of doorknobs, yeah. you know. Like uh, we, we were all and we were all carrying, I think, probably at least. A couple different uh, quarter block GP charges on yeah, us yeah. too. Like, yeah, th- those first couple hits we did, I just look at those pictures and I'm like, bro, bro, <laughs> cargo <laughs> pockets a, full, a lot of crap, dripping oh, yeah. with mags and frags. Yeah, just flashbangs yeah. hung all over me like a Christmas tree. And like, I remember like rolling off, and I was like drenched, oh, like yeah. fucking, like like I got water dumped on top yeah. of me. That's how fucking sweaty I was because I was getting yeah. fucking cold. Yep. I was like, you know, my I'm like shaking, not because I'm like afraid because it, it's done, right? I'm yeah, like, oh my God, I'm wet. cold. I'm soaking wet. Like yeah. it's like throwing a bucket of water on me. I was like, oh my God, that, I'm carrying a lot of shit. Yeah. Especially when you try to like climb, like when you got into the reality of yeah. urban warfare as opposed to like the shoot house where you can flow through, even if you have a bunch of stuff on. Yeah. Like the second way to start climbing over walls, I just remember getting jammed up and stuck and like – it's like, okay, we got to start making some changes here. And then you look at pictures later on. You know, like you said, you got like, it's like two mags. <laughs> two mags. Everything's <laughs> light. Like just yeah. tri- just stripping everything off. Yeah. Like I, I I used to ask guys all the time. I was like, did you ever use your pistol? Like, did you ever shoot your pistol in combat? No. I mean, uh, doing a lot of like low profile stuff, it would, it would like people are like, oh, it's never your primary weapon. I'm like, yeah, I did a lot of stuff in vehicles where yeah. it was my primary, but I, I never shot anybody with a pistol. Yeah. No. I, I, I only know like two or three dudes that did. No, I, same with me. Yeah. I know like one guy, um, I, I, I've, I've asked this question to like a bunch of guys and obviously there's a few here and there depending on the scenario, but uh, by, I would say, 08, I was in Mosul, 08, 09. And I just decided to even like stop. I was like, I'm just going to carry an extra two frags or whatever. I was like, I'm not even going to carry it. Cause it's like, by the time I look, look through everything I was carrying, <laughs> I was like, nah, yeah. I, if things go really pear shaped, I'm just going to need extra frags. I'm not exactly. actually going to need right. this. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I think that evolution. So when you started, you know, primarily as an assaulter, you started evolving through the wars. Oh, yeah. And, like how important did you determine like good tactical intelligence to be? 
Oh man, it was everything. I mean, that's everything. really that I, that to me kind of dictated the, like almost the trajectory of my career. Because I thought coming from Ranger Battalion and then going to a team that was heavily focused on direct action, I was like, I don't know, maybe someday I want to try out for Delta. Or like I, to me, I hadn't really thought past like when we kick in the door, when we hang the charge. But then when I got there, it was like, man, what the hell is Intel? Because sometimes it was good. Sometimes it was bad. It sort of seemed like this magic thing that kind of fell yeah. out of the sky, especially when we were doing unilateral DA because we would just get handed targets. And then we would just you know, plan the target and execute the target. And so for me, I was like, hmm. Where does this intelligence come from? You know, but then once we split off and we started training the Iraqis, and then from there we actually went into split team operations. And so we were, I was one of four guys at this location of a company of Iraqi commandos. Luckily, again, my team sergeant, phenomenal guy, was like, let's just start talking to the Iraqis. That's what Green Berets do. He's like, we'll get better intel than freaking any of the bullshit they're going to give us from, from the FOB. Yeah. And I was like, man, he was right. I mean, after that, once we started actually, being able to run our own rudimentary human sources uh, because we could really have a lot of control on that. We could do our own reconnaissance. Um, it was, it became invaluable, but I, I did see that as being like the missing piece. When I looked around like mid 03, 04, I was like, man, there's no shortage right now of dudes like me with, with cool kit who think they're like the best shooter ever. Uh, everybody's kind of fighting over the same targets. Like mm. the seals had gotten there. The Polish Grom was there. Uh, Mar the Mars, the, the uh, forefathers of uh, Marsoc, Det One, they yeah. were there. Like yeah, yeah. everybody was kicking indoors, yeah. you know. Delta and the Rangers were over there. SEAL Team Six was running around doing something, you know. I was like, man, the, the issue, the 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 hard part of this isn't going out and killing the bad guys, because even when this stuff gets handed over to like the regular army, like at the end of the day, it might not look like Delta Force, but they're still going to kill the bad guy, you know. Like they might just shoot tow rounds at it or, or AT4s, sure. but like that's the easy part. I was like, the hard part is figuring out what the hell is actually going on and where the bad guys are. And so that kind of ended up driving the, the trajectory of my career. Well, it, what, I guess like my, my question on that is like when you think about how important good intel was and then how important it was specifically for special operations, did you see during that time this – uh, what I would say is evolution yeah, of the, of the tactical sure. warfighter special operations community into way more intelligence driven apparatus. Yeah, for right? sure. For sure. I, I think most of us probably got a little frustrated with the top down nature. Yeah. Uh, I know like looking at how uh, some of the other units ended up bringing in a lot of Intel uh, assets to enable their operations. They definitely drove it that way. I think SF, like the ODA had a, just a natural advantage because we were used to going into places like that was, you know, Robin Sage. Like yeah. you, you learn that as a, as a brand new Green Beret. Like you go in, you develop your, you might not call it human, but like you might not call it source operations, mm -hmm. but that's what you're actually doing. And so, I mean, especially those first couple of years when we were in Baghdad and we were operating either in split team locations or eventually that next 04 rotation, we were all uh, just at FOB, uh, what was it, FOB Justice over there mm -hmm. in, in, in Katamiya. Um, we were in the heart of Baghdad and we had access to freaking everybody. everybody. I mean, like the, the warrant on my team basically mapped out all of Sauter's network to the point where like the agency eventually found out that like he, he knew everything and he had all the sources. And so it was just like, if we're here, we're boots on the ground and we're actually interacting with the people, we are far better off. I mean, like when we were chasing Zarqawi through Baghdad, we were, you know, lots of good stories there, but like we were getting intel faster than all the, all the people who were supposed to have it ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And that was just because we were tapped in the ground level. But then watching like, you know, some of the other units evolve, they basically were just having to recreate what was already organically on a special forces team, you know, maybe with some more assets like, you know, uh, ISR and, and better SIGINT and all that, but it was the same thing, you know? So you know, on your, in your time in Iraq, um, like one of the things I wanted to talk about was like people discuss the definition of courage. Mm -hmm. Like they they discuss it like it's more of a textbook definition specifically yeah. related to maybe a more philosophically principled uh, word. But but give me some examples to the things that you saw and or your definition of yeah. courage. Well, I think the, the the easiest definition of courage is the guys who uh, volunteer to go do the things where the glory is not necessarily a guaranteed, mm -hmm. you know, we're like, hey, we might get stitched up on this um, and I'll volunteer to be the one man, you know, saw a lot of that like on, on my team. And then you also do see a lot of guys, not a lot, but you see some guys who are like, you know, I'm, I'm good not doing that. You know, right. like I've already got the title of Green Beret. I've already got the title of whatever special operator. Like I don't want to put myself in that position. Um, and, and seeing that actually like in real time, like who would volunteer 
to do the to do the stuff that's very uncertain. Um, who would volunteer to go do the the recon where they like you literally had no support? You know, it was like you and your you, you and maybe one other American, mm. and, you know, dressed up like a, like a local, trying to figure out where the bad guys are. Like there wasn't a lot of guys that were willing to to flap it out there and do that. You know, uh, so that seeing that natural sorting process take place, but then also I mean seeing courage under fire of people who you never would have expected it from. Like we had a support kid. Uh, I think he was a commo guy. It just ended up like at our team location. And that dude was an absolute animal. He's like an E4, you know, like zero combat training. Maybe he went to like the last three days of his FAWC and qualified of his M4 right. before deployment. But like that guy freaking fought his way out of an ambush. Like any any time the bullets were flying, like he was there doing his job. You know, it's like, man, I, I didn't expect that. That's, you know, a lot of courage. But then I think as the wars went on, I had a lot of respect for uh, commanders, especially who would say like, things are not going well here, you know, like, cause the, the, the right thing to do as a commander, the right thing, air quotes, if you want to get promoted was to say that, Hey, we're making progress. Here's the metrics and the, and the way that we're making progress. And I think that my team has done this great job. The commanders who had the, the maturity and the courage to say like, Hey, no ding on anything we're doing, but this ain't working. And I started to see a lot of that, like in uh, my first team leader, I think was, was pretty courageous in that regard. Uh, but especially like 05, 06, uh, Chris Miller, who became secretary of defense mm -hmm. at one point, he was my battalion commander. Really? Yeah. In 06, <laughs> 07. And, and, and one of the reasons why I always respected the guy, he had a legendary career before that. So he was already kind of a big deal, but a very humble guy. But I, I do remember him giving what should have been your standard battalion commander, like rah, rah, we all kick some butt speech. And he was just brutally honest. You know, he was like, I don't know if what we're doing is actually being effective, mm -hmm. you know, like I know you guys are doing the best that you can. Um, but this, this isn't going the way it it's supposed to go. It's not going the way it's being briefed back home. And you guys know that, and I'm not going to bullshit you. Um, I, I just had a lot of respect for that because there's just so many people throughout the years who would, you know, they get put in that command position and their job was to say, you know, yes, sir. No, sir. Three bags full. Everything's going great. You know, we're, we're, tur we're making, we're turning the corner. We're making progress. Um, so the people that would actually speak out about that, they usually didn't have very long careers. And right. I, I didn't see very many of them, if any that I can think of, become general officers. Um, but to have that courage, I think, is pretty significant. Yeah, it's it's, it, it's interesting. I think when you, when you think about being a Green Beret, you think about today, like the quiet professional. Yeah. So how do you feel and define... And, and what I would say is balance your life as a Green Beret, uh, the ethos of being a quiet professional, and then also like your public persona. Today. Yeah. Like, yeah. What, what, unpack that for me a little bit. Like, it's it's weird, man, um, because I basically never really planned on being a public person. Yeah. Just, you know, just like the course of my life, it, it ended up happening. And so I still have a really, I, I think sometimes people are like, hey, you're kind of cagey or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, like, I think most political consultants would be like, hey, you sh if you can wear your uniform, to a like, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you should just be out there like USA. Could you, you wear know, your beret you, you to know, these like, things? Right? Yeah. I mean, like people, people are going to eat that up. And there is a, a certain segment of the population that will kind of eat that stuff up. I mean, I, for me, it's like, hey, if people want to ask me questions, like I'm happy to answer them. Uh, I think it's an important part of my story, um, but it's not like everything. Mm -hmm. But it's hard, man. It, it, it's, uh, it's definitely, uh, it's hard to strike the balance. I do feel... Um, like veterans with our experience do need to start speaking out more for a wide variety of reasons. Obviously, politics, which I'm heavily invested in, mm -hmm. everything we talked about with what what went wrong with the wars, I think we have an obligation to, to speak out about that. Um, but then also, like, you know, why I wrote the book about Shannon and, and kind of the stuff that like Marty does, um, telling veteran stories, you know, I, I think it's pretty important. I mean, there's a difference between being a silent professional and being a quiet professional. Yeah. Like you don't need to beat your chest about everything. You don't need to put other people down. But I do think it's important for people to tell their stories and not just special operators. I mean, there's guys out there who, you know, were doing logistics yeah. in Iraq and Afghanistan that have a story to tell. Um, like the only reason I knew exactly what I wanted to be when I grew up is because I read all the Vietnam paperbacks, mm -hmm. you know, about guys in Vietnam and I read Soldier of Fortune and all that type of stuff. So I think there is a lot of value in us telling our story. But I, for me, it's something I always struggle with. It's like, do I, do I tell a war story right now? Or is that just me trying to like sound cool, you know? Cause it's so hard to sift through like what yeah. you see 
on social media versus like, I'm trying to explain to you who I am, where I'm coming from, but I'm also at the same time, not, not trying to just sound like, you know, the next guy who's trying to sell you, you know, whatever special operations, you know, gimmick. Yeah. Well, and that's interesting because I, I think there's, there is a, a once, once again, there's a balancing act yeah. between what I would say is, you know, quiet or silent depending yeah. on who you are, but it's also, it's your background, right? It, yeah. it provides what I would say is legitimate reference to your experience exactly. and why you're speaking to a certain point and why that yeah. people should listen to you. Yeah. We talked about it before, uh, before the podcast, but we, we both have this like very passionate agreement to, we have to get veterans involved in, in policy decisions yeah. from the government level, especially war fighters. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, why, why do you think it's important to have the war fighter involved in that? I mean, if we're going to ask people to go over and fight and die, the people doing the asking, I think need to have a level of understanding of, of what that actually is. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I know there's, there's some really sharp minds out there in foreign policy from guys who have never heard a shot fired in anger in their life. And so I'm not saying that like in order to even talk about foreign policy or war, like you have to be a veteran. I'll caveat that with if your, an if your answer to every single foreign policy uh, issue is to send in the military and send in the troops or get us involved in another proxy war, I'm going to need you to go ahead and serve. <laughs> I, in, order, in order for me to listen to you, tell me one more time on why we need to go to war in Eastern Europe. We need to yeah. go back in the Middle East. We should never leave Iraq and Afghanistan. Right. Like if that's your stance, I'm going to need you to go ahead and listen to the infantry uh, before I want, before I hear any more of that. Because like, it's just, we've gotten it so wrong for so long to continue to listen to those people is ridiculous. It, but it's hard though, uh, for policymakers and politicians who don't have a military background, um, there's a lot of people who I really like. Matt Gates has been has done a great job speaking out against endless wars. He's not a veteran. He's spot on with everything he says. Mm -hmm. But he a lot of a lot of the more you know traditional Republicans and, and and Democrats will be like, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Like he was never in the military. And it's like, okay, well, let's get some more fighters in there. We're starting mm -hmm. to get a lot more in there. Now you've got Eli Crane, Anna yeah. Paulina Luna, Corey Mills. They were some of the ones that put forward with Gates put forward the legislation last spring to get our troops out of Iraq and Syria. Would have saved those three service members' lives. Would have saved all the guys who've gotten wounded since. Would have saved their lives. Would have given Iran less opportunities to strike at us. So it's good we're getting more veterans in there because for all the critics and the haters, they couldn't go after them and say like, well, what do you know? Because they right. can just turn around and be like, well, I was there with you, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? And so I do think we we need that in order to, to really explain to the American people, like, what does it mean to actually go to war? And especially... The GWAS are our nation's longest war, but we fought it with an all-volunteer force. And right. we've never done that before. Every other time we fought a war, like, we had to do a draft. And so there was actually a consensus from the American people that, like, we will send our, our sons primarily, sons and some daughters, off to go fight and die. The GWAS, we basically, like, we wrote the check and we cashed it. Like, yeah. it, was, it was all kind of on us, you know? Because, I mean, I, I, I don't really know any veterans that only did one tour. Most guys like did multiple combat deployments. And so I do think it's really easy for the country to kind of get some amnesia from the GWAT because it didn't affect the whole country. Right. You know, and, and so now it's very easy to rile everybody up and say the situation in Ukraine, like we're going to fight to the last dead Ukrainian and then maybe we'll let NATO get us involved. Like, hey, you know, we've seen this movie before. We've actually heard all this exact same propaganda before. So I, I do think it's really important for guys with with our backgrounds to come in and say like, we know how this ends. We know what the cost is. If you want to have a discussion about the cost, let's let's talk about that, and we can give you our actual real world perspective. But you know, no no more theory and no more just sloganeering to take us off to combat. Yeah, I think it does it. It does a. Um, it doesn't do justice to the experience that we've actually cultivated over the course of the last couple of decades to not have voices at that table that yeah. lend a lens of credibility to the conversation yeah. and to discredit them because they don't have what I would say is strategic policy decision making or formal background or an education yeah. from, you know, Harvard or Stanford. And <laughs> yeah. We all know how important that is. Right. Um, it, it devalues the uh, cost and I think there's probably very few people in the United States that actually understand the cost as much as you do, uh, because, you know, obviously I mean, your book, I mean, this has been written with you and Marty. I mean, you talk specifically around Shannon, like take me back, like, where did you guys meet? 
and like how did how did your relationship kind of unfold? Yeah, yeah. So we actually met the first time in 07 for like 10 minutes. Seriously? Then I didn't see her again for till 2013. Right. But yeah, we uh, I, I attended a briefing that she was giving at the the uh, the Ville. Um, yeah, so she was she was there working as a, a SIG targeter. Okay, she just showed up, and that's where she was assigned to. And I was there, you know, doing my thing, trying to collect intel. You right. know, and she was giving a brief on a, a Shia target set, and we talked for like ten minutes. And I was like, I'm going to go back and you know get her number, chat her up, chat her up properly at some point. And she was gone, you know. So I didn't see her again until until 2013. We both ended up in a training course for a, a pretty unique unit that combines special operations people and intelligence folks. Right. So we hit it off right away because I was like, I think I know you. And she's like, Yeah, I know you. So we started started dating then, and then within a year we were we were married. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it it's like really weird by normal standards, by by most people's standards, kind of a weird like courting dating process and then getting married. But it was like we in the course of this year we were both very busy because we were going through training, which is pretty high stress. Mm-hmm. We you know we were dating when we had time, um, but it was just kind of like a we 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 both sort of knew after like the first month or two that we were going to get married at some point. So it was, yeah, went, it went really well. Um, and then we both had a passion for what we did professionally. Um, a lot of that changed with, with Shannon later on, once we started having kids. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, I I know this isn't for every, every guy, but like for guys that do this professionally, I think a big issue of maintaining relationships is that you can't tell your wife Mm -hmm. a lot, you know, because of clearance reasons, or even if you could tell her, would she truly understand for me at that point, like I was deploying was my life, you know, yeah. deploying and going to the next, you know, whatever unit selection and, and trying to work my way up that, that ladder, uh, that was my life and that was hers too. And so it was pretty refreshing because I could just be honest with her, you know, like, Hey, I'm, I'm going here, I'm doing this thing for this period of time. And there was never any, you know, well, when are you coming back? Why are you doing this? Right. There was never any of that. Yeah. So when you guys, I guess, linked up in 2013, and then you dated. How long was it before you guys had kids? About a year. About a year and some change. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And twins? No, no. Uh, two two boys, but they're about 18 months apart. Oh, okay. All yeah. Right. yeah. So yeah. 18 months apart. Yeah. And you're still like yeah, hitting it. Yeah, I'm still running and gunning, man. You're still yeah. running and gunning. She's having kids and still – Yeah, like, up, up at the – you know, she was up at the NSA, so she right. was still doing stuff, still engaged, but she did take some time. It's not really like time off because she was still working, hunting bad guys from, you know, behind a computer screen um, and, and doing some pretty pretty serious stuff. Uh, but, yeah, she didn't deploy again until in her final deployment. Right. Uh, but, yeah, she was, she was attempting to become a, a psychiatrist to kind of go down, to be able to be more stable at home. Right. Um, and do that program, but the the good old military with their their catch twenty two. She had survived cancer, got it cut out, was cancer free. Um, she got accepted into the med school. She passed all the tests and all that. But then they're going to commission you as an officer, and so you have to pass a session standards. And if you've had cancer before, you're ineligible to become an officer. But if you're in the military and you've survived cancer, you meet retention standards. The military will still keep you and send you off to war. So that's why she ended up uh, staying kind of on the deployment cycle. Well, I, I, well, one, why write the book? I guess that's probably yeah, like yeah. number one question. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why, but like from you, why do you think it was important for you to write it? Yeah. I mean, I wrote the book uh, for two main reasons. Like number one was for our boys. I mean, mm-hmm. cause they were yep. one and three when she got killed. Mm-hmm. So they, they didn't really get to know their mom and they're going to hear a lot about their mom. They hear a lot about their mom from me and from, from our family. We talk about her all the time. Um, but I wanted them to have something that they could kind of grab on their own. And when they're old enough to just take their own time going through it and getting to know their mom. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I obviously, I wrote the portions about our relationship and our kids and our family, but Marty went back and he did basically investigative journalism about Shannon's life. And he really kind of filled in the, the gaps uh, before we got married and, and, you know, her military career. So it's going to give them an opportunity to get to know her, you know, beyond the family stories and all that, and hopefully generate more questions and, and that type of thing. Uh, so it's, it's primarily for my boys. But then also, I think it's really important to tell the stories um, of people who haven't had their stories told before. Mm-hmm. Like number one, like women in combat, um, 2014, whenever they signed that memo that women can finally go to combat. Well, women have been in combat basically yeah. since the beginning of the GWAT. Right. You know? And Shannon was one of them. She 
you know, worked your way into special operations, not because special operations was like, well, gosh, we sure need to have some women here. I mean, it was basically her language ability, her ability to do human and SIGINT and her value added to special operations. That's why she, you know, earned a slot essentially on the, on the varsity team. So I think it's important to tell that story. Shannon would always, she would always say to me, she's like, you can walk into a room and say, I'm a Green Beret. And everybody will understand what that means. Mm -hmm. She's like, it doesn't matter how many deployments I did. I mean, she was killed on her fifth combat deployment, special operations. She's like, it doesn't matter how many deployments I do. Like, I go into a room full of, you know, special operations guys, military guys. It takes me five minutes to explain who I am, what, I, what I've done. And they right. probably won't believe me anyways, so why even bother? Um, so I think, you know, in terms of like, let's let's give some credit to people who haven't had a chance to tell their story. And through telling her story, I think there's a lot of other women that are either out now or, or still in that are like, OK, all right, our, our story's actually being told. Maybe I can tell mine as well. I think that's I think that's important. Yeah, I think as a guy, you know, I've got two little girls. Yeah, I think, you know, they hear my story or my friend's stories all the time. Right. Yeah. As they're in and around us all the time. I think it's super important, um, especially a guy that has uh, two daughters to have this specific insight into you know, a female that was deployed into combat zone that did all these incredible things yeah. and then be able to take away from a story that's not, you know, an SF guy or, yeah. you know, you know, exactly. a dude, I think it directly represents where, you know, the future of women in, in specific like combat related roles yeah. can go, you know, cause I, obviously you and I've had enough exposure to the Intel community and we know that, you know, there's a huge percentage of the Intel community is female. Yeah. I mean, in that, that was also part of, I would say, my learning experience, which was, uh, you know, being more on the Intel side of things and then being exposed to, uh, you know, women in the Intel community. Yeah. And then, like, they were like, so <laughs> incredible. Mm -hmm. I, and yeah. I would say, like, quite literally, I would say some of the best Intel officers I ever worked with were some of the most unassuming females you'd ever work 100%. with. 100%. Like, yeah. probably one of the best like case officer that I ever worked with. Um, she was like five foot one, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. and she could speak four different languages. Yep. She could blend in in North Korea, in Pakistan. It didn't matter. She just mm -hmm. had a really way, you know, a way that she could blend in pretty much anywhere. She yeah. was completely unassuming. She could talk about like, you know, mechanical engineering, uh, electronics. She could, she could do anything. Yeah. And she was fucking brilliant. Right. So, it really opened my eyes to the point where I was like, okay, well, this isn't just about gun toting, right? Exactly. And obviously, like, you know, exactly. that's the cool guy shit. Right, right. But having a person like her that mm -hmm. understood exactly what we were doing and the importance and then more importantly, ready to fucking push the limits. Yeah. So we could get what we needed yeah. and be able to prioritize and triage and ask the right questions and Definitely. push the right fucking yeah. push the right buttons. Wow. Yeah. It was incredible. That was something else me and uh, Marty tried to do with the book. There's there's portions of the book where we re recreate scenes based on both of our experiences and me talking to Shannon. But we really tried to kind of shine a light as much as we could, you know, adhering to classification and all that with the intelligence piece. of Because I don't think that story has really been told either. Right. There's, there's a bazillion stories about kicking in doors and shooting yeah. bad guys. But really, like, how do we how do we hunt humans? Um, and so we tried to really bring that into the forefront of the of the storytelling of the book because that really was Shannon's career. I mean, mm -hmm. when you look at, you know, what did she do in the military? She's got a title. She was a crypto linguist and she spoke Arabic. And so I think it's easy to say, like, she was just sitting there listening and translating to Arabic. But what she did in combat and why she was in special operations, like, she was the one hunting terrorists, you know, and painting an X on them. So, you know, guys could go kill them or they could drop a bomb on them. But literally, that was her job. And, like, how does that happen, especially in a— in a tactical environment when you have to go out into dangerous and uncertain places and talk to, you know, unsavory, shady characters who may end up wanting to kill you. So we tried to really explain a lot of that in the book. And that's another another aspect, I think. It's it's finally time to tell that story as much as we can, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, adhering to classification and all that. Yeah. How hard was that as far as like like navigating the, the – yeah. because obviously a huge percentage of her life is just – Yeah. It's, it's not open source and it's not anything that you can really discuss. So yeah. was that – pretty challenging being able to just like one, you know, I, I think Marty had, and Marty Scovelin had very unique access to yeah. very specific, uh, well, I mean, he, he was telling me, well, I was talking to him a couple of weeks ago about, he got these like complete reports and he yeah. had like 
almost unfiltered access to some of the things yeah. that she had done to the point of which he doesn't think that other journalists or writers would have even had that type of access. I don't think just so. Just based on who he was and what he'd done. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think Marty having the, the reputation and the trust already in the community and him coming from Ranger Battalion. Like, yeah. I mean, that's the big reason why I wanted to write the book mm-hmm. with him specifically. He understood. And then also I knew that he wasn't trying to just write because there's I have so many military authors that are trying to write a tell-all yeah. on yeah, yeah. whatever, special operations, the intel community. So I, between Marty and I, when we – when we wrote it, we both had an eye towards let's tell the story, but let's this isn't going to be the book that's the tell all, mm-hmm. you know. Let 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 someone else do that. We're we're here to tell Shannon's story, um, but and paint as much of a picture as we possibly can about the value of intelligence, you know, about how we collect intelligence, how we hunt humans. Uh, but we both had a really heavy eye towards that, so we lean more into the storytelling and mm-hmm. focusing on on the people that are involved. Um, so I think for both of us with our backgrounds and our experience, and we sort of knew what the red lines were yeah, and we submitted right. it to DOD and the CIA and the NSA mm-hmm. and all that stuff too. So I feel like we're in a pretty good spot. We, you, you won't see too many, we left the redactions that are in there because it's kind of funny, like the, the stuff they end up redacting. <laughs> I'm like, you guys, re- okay, all right, whatever. I'm pretty sure most people will know exactly what we're talking about or <laughs> yeah. Google it or hopefully, <laughs> I, I hope they think it's actually something cooler than it really is. Um, but yeah, yeah so we, we wanted to have a, an eye towards, you know, protecting the really important stuff while still telling the story. And again, man, I, I, I couldn't have done that without Marty. Had it just been somebody who was like, whatever, a, Award-winning writer. Yeah, like right. I know they would have had a temptation to be like, let's put more in there. Let's put more let's, in there. Let's, let's add some salacious details. So yeah, exactly. Can, like, yeah. Spice this thing up. And yeah. it's just not needed, I don't think. I mean, it's uh, characterization uh, as far as being able to take away points of value from it. I think I think Marty's done an incredible uh, – you and Marty both. I, yeah. I, Marty told me that you, you had a – a huge contribution that you're, which doesn't surprise me whatsoever in the context of you're, you're an accomplished writer or you can write well. Yeah. Um, yeah I try to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, it's so, so, you know, it's so, so interesting. Cause I think Marty said something like, man, it's so, so surprising. Like Joe's a great writer. And I was like, <laughs> why is that surprising? Like he, like he, he's, he's very articulate. Like you sit him down, like he, he, how many interviews have you done so far? Oh, like, I, yeah, like lot. thousands Thousand probably, at this yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I I think that it's it's definitely a story that 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 needs to be told, and I think you know for those that don't know, like uh, I, I would say just go over, you know what what happened, yeah. and then you know how she was killed, yeah. and then like I think the the last or the following year post that, and how that's yeah. directly affected your life. Yeah, so she was killed uh, in January of 2019. So her and, and three other Americans, uh, Scott Wirtz, uh, former Navy SEAL, working for the DIA. Yeah, Scotty and I were friends. Oh, you know Scott? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We worked in Kabul. We did a couple couple different rotations before Boy. we went to the DIA. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great dude, man. From Washington. Yeah. Shannon really liked him. Uh, John Farmer, Green Beret from mm-hmm. Fifth Group, who I knew. And then uh, Gadir Ta, who's a uh, Syrian-American linguist. So they were all killed in a suicide bomber, by a suicide bomber uh, in Mambij. Um, and this was about a month after we were supposed to be out of Syria. Um, so there's a lot, there's a ton of politics involved and people right. always wonder like, how did you get involved in politics and all this type of stuff? And this, this really thrust me because it deeply affected my life and into right. politics. They were actually supposed to be out of Syria Christmas Eve because after the task force took out all the ground that ISIS controlled, that's when Trump said, okay, well, there's never a good time to leave, but we just took away the, all the ground the caliphate controls. Like right. the caliphate is defeated. Like, are you ever going to defeat Islamic extremism, like that's what they want you to believe. So you leave bases there forever. So right. he gave the order to pull them out. That's when Mattis and a bunch of other unelected bureaucrats decided that they were going to protest, withdraw, drag their feet, slow roll. So I kind of saw, because I was at the time I had just retired, but I was in CIA mm-hmm. as, a, as a paramilitary operations officer, we could communicate you know, freely on classified systems. And I was reading all the traffic and I was like, man, I, I feel like this is not going in a good direction. I think now there's a lot of downward pressure on the task force to create a mission, right? To like get out there and get busy. Like the, the the guys in DC think we don't need to be here anymore. Let's go show them. Let's go find some targets. Like this is still a war. And I mean, one of the last conversations I had with Shannon, I was just like, don't don't be the last person to die in a war that everybody's already forgotten about. You know, like just be careful, as careful as you possibly right. can. Um, but you know, it, it, she was there doing her job, um, and their job was to be out front looking for bad guys. And and that's ultimately what, what got him killed. I mean, I think it's, there's only so many times you can, you can be in this profession and be lucky and mm-hmm. come home. And I, I do think for Shannon and I, 
uh, just going and deploying and war fighting was like, it, it was like, it's all we did. It's our family. Everyone we knew was on that cycle. We both had friends who had been killed in action. Um, I don't want to say we were complacent, but we were basically like, okay, we'll just go do this deployment. It's not a big deal. Come back. Then you'll go do a deployment. It was just, it was so routine for us. Um, but as the, the politics surrounding the withdrawal were going on, I just, ha I had a horrible feeling. I was like, man, something, something is going to go wrong because things are so confusing right now. Um, and they, they unfortunately did, but I was actually deployed. I was, I was not in Syria, but I was in, in the kind of in the theater at the time with the agency. Um, and I knew she was outside the wire. I knew she was in Mambage that day. I got back from being outside the wire myself. And then a, a mutual friend of ours, I don't, I won't say his name, mm -hmm. but, uh, he was my boss. I don't know if he's still, <clears throat> I think he's still somewhat involved. So I won't say his name, but he was my boss there. And he just asked everybody to leave the office and said he needed to talk to me. And so I was like, man, I just, did, screw, did I screw something up? Like, and he was just like, hey, I'm going to tell you what we know. Uh, we don't know much right now. He's like, but there's been a suicide bombing in Manbridge. There's four U.S. killed. Two of them are women. Do you know where Shannon is? And I was like, fuck, she's, she's in Manbridge. So we spent about the next hour trying to get more details, tried to call the task force in Syria, tried to call our guys in Syria. And about an hour later, we got the, the final confirmation that, that she was killed. So from there, uh, we flew out, or I actually the agency got an aircraft there the next morning to fly me back to the states. Yeah, how like, how do you start to rebuild like after that? I mean, obviously you got two small kids at home. Yeah. Now your uh, widow, yeah. and you've got to raise your boys. Yeah. Like what what happens in your life at that point? Yeah, I mean, coming flying back out of the Middle East, I just was like, okay. I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't yeah. put my kids in this position. I was only supposed to be over there for like 30 days, but she was deployed. And like, I worked out in my head that that was okay. Mm. And the kids are with my parents. Um, but I was like, you know, I was outside the wire that day too. Right. So like had the enemy gotten double lucky, which happens, you yeah. know, my kids could be orphans right now. So I was just like, I got to completely step away. And I had never considered leaving like that environment. I mean, it did 20 years <laughs> in special yeah. operations and like I retired on a Friday and I swore in on a Monday at the right. agency. So I, I planned on staying in that lifestyle basically for the rest of my life, you know, um, that was the plan, but it, you know, flying back there, I was like, that's, I got to figure out something completely different. And I knew myself well enough to be like, well, I can't, if I stay in this environment, I'll get sucked back in. Uh, the agency was really good. They gave me all the time I needed. They offered me a bunch of other jobs that would have been, you know, kind of staff in the rear. Right. But I, again, I, I knew myself, I was like, man, I'll, I'll find it in a year. I'll find a justification of why I need to go. So I, I needed a, for me, I needed a hard break. Um, and I needed to get my kids close to my family. So I was like, I'm gonna move back to the Northwest to get the boys closer to my parents and, and to give them some stability. Um, that was the, that was the goal at that point and to start to start to write the book and all that. And that was the first time I think I had really stepped out kind of into the, into the real, the rest of the country, you know, and taking myself out of the, that special operations deploying environment. Um, and I didn't really have a, a plan, you know, I was like, I'm going to find a job doing something, um, but really try and dedicate the most time to, to the kids. Yeah. What was that like culturally? Because you're, you've been in the special operations community the, like for 20 plus years. Yeah. You go back home basically. Yeah. yeah. What were the things that you noticed instantly that were different than what you remembered? Well, I mean, I grew up in Portland and I actually moved for a brief period of time right back down the street from my parents just to get the kids closer. Um, and so it's weird going back to your hometown, like as an adult. Yeah. It's one thing to go back and visit. It's another thing when you're like, oh man, I'm, I'm like, was I just dreaming for the last 20 years? Like, because <laughs> right. you I mean, everything kind of looked the same in my little pocket of, uh, of Southwest Portland, but I could tell that Portland had really changed. It, I didn't notice it when I was back visiting, but when you live there and you, you know, you're talking to, you know, your, your new neighbors and you're just seeing how radically different it was. And it wasn't, for me, it wasn't necessarily, like I knew Portland was liberal. Like it wasn't sure. like, oh, all these crazy liberals, you know, like I, <laughs> it's easy for people to say that now. Like he's a crazy Republican. Of course he thinks that, but it's like, I, I grew up here. I kind of knew, I knew the deal. Um, but really, especially when COVID started, that was when I really started seeing that like, oh, things are very different. We, we have a very different country um, that's gone in a direction that I'm just, I'm really not familiar with you know, based on how focused I was overseas for so long. Um, so, yeah, no, it was, it was weird. And I, I, uh, 
I know a lot of guys, you know, you, you guys talk about transition a lot. I had just never, I never planned on transitioning. So it was like, okay, well, here I am. It's like forced. Um, what's the rest of my life look like, you know? And so for me, it was just like, well, you got kids. So that needs to be the, that needs to be the focus. Make sure the environment for them is good. That's why we ended up eventually leaving Portland. Um, but yeah, it, it was, uh, still, still something we're dealing with. Yeah. Still challenging. Yeah. I think, you know, cause I, I, I would say that I, I kind of transitioned over in 15 more than anything. And I was like, man, this is like way different. You know, yeah. I mean, obviously th there was an accelerant there with, you know, COVID and you had all these other things that were like, yeah. the, what I would say is that circumstances yeah. that kind of highlighted the differences between, between folks. And, you know, we live in a very isolated bubble of people yeah. where you could execute and get things done. You know, yeah. you could, you, you could understand a mission. You could collectively organize towards it. Even the bottom 10% was actually better than like a huge percentage of other people <laughs> right. on the outside. Because if, if you were a piece of shit, like it was relatively known, <laughs> like it was fairly obvious, and and everybody knew, everybody and, and there knew. was no hiding from it. Yeah, know? there's no like, hiding until you like did a, a huge redemption arc, and even mm -hmm. then, people were still probably going to be like, "That guy's come back." Mm -hmm. Yeah, know? like yeah. Well, I mean, I think one of the things that still amazes me today is is like I think about it, you know, how important just the the my military experience and then being able to understand you know like there are little pieces that we take away like discipline is one like we just live a life of relative like discipline yeah we don't necessarily understand because it's it's rote memorization essentially we, it's just on a yeah. rinse wash repeat cycle and we don't fully comprehend nor do we articulate it and i don't think you and i are even close to being those influencers that are out there like you know, discipline, you know, like we don't, we just <laughs> right, like, right, yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. for me, I just kind of make jokes and fuck, yeah. fuck around. But I did, I, I do sometimes kick myself. I'm like, dude, if I could have been telling people to wake up early and just work out, I'd be like a multimillionaire. Like, <laughs> Why did I think of that? Like, I can't hate on them because it's like, damn, damn. I didn't realize there was a market for that. Yeah. I, and by the way, I'm like, and it's good messaging too. It is. I, I think it's something that they need. I, I, I think regardless of whatever negative, um, uh, uh, perception there is depending on the influencer. I'm like telling people to harden up. Oh yeah. Eh, it's fantastic. Yeah. It's fantastic. I mean, I think yeah. there's, there's a whole generation of, of what I would say is, is younger, you know, boys and girls out there. Yeah. They're like, suck it up is, 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 is a learned skill. You can learn yeah. to suck it up. You can, you can learn to suck it up. Yeah. And sometimes it has to be a forced environment because I think you and I have been forced in those environments where it's like, Hey, we can suck it up. Mm -hmm. And then it just becomes, you can automatic. Do it. Yeah. yeah. You can do it. Yeah. So how important is that now when you look at raising your kids? Yeah. Like like the importance of what like, teaching them and then developing that skill and making sure that they don't turn like yeah, flip the switch into like lazy, complacent. Yeah. Like is that like a constant never present thought? It no, it totally is for me. I mean, I I think one of the big differences between like raising kids right now and when we were raised, when our parents raised us, is you have to be way more deliberate on what your kid does because society has become so toxic. I think when we were being brought up, like, yeah, there was some bad stuff in society, but there was still like a high trust society that had a, like a more of a monolithic culture mm -hmm. where like you could send your kids to the public school in the eighties and the nineties. And nobody was going to tell them that, you know, maybe they're actually not a girl or a boy and they shouldn't tell their parents. And, you know, if you want, we'll give you gender transition. So like that's happening in Washington state right now. Um, you could send your kids to the local boy scout troop and they were going to get put through. I mean, I was in, very involved in boy scouts and like, it was a great experience, you know, really prepared me for the military, taught me a lot about life. Um, but that was just, that just existed in the community. You know, it was just there. It was, it was a staple institution. And same thing basically with every single sports team from T-ball up to, to high school football. And that's changed and that's changed for a wide variety of reasons, but, but that high trust is now gone. And I don't, I don't think as a parent nowadays, you can just be like, well, I'm, I'm just going to send my kids to these same institutions that I got sent to when I was a kid because they've changed radically. And so you've got to be way more deliberate with, especially instilling discipline. And it's, it's tough with little boys. I mean, uh, little men are savages, you know, and they can be good savages. They can be bad savages, but they're going to be some degree of a savage. 
um, they have that, they have that in them. And so you've really got to teach them, you know, Hey, this is a proper outlet for your creative destruction. And this, yeah. is, this is not a problem. And so you've really got to draw lines, you know, and we have a society that does not like to draw lines. They don't like to tell people actually that's wrong. You know, here's right. the right thing, but people, Whoa, Hey, you can't say that I'm wrong. This is, this is my truth. This, you know, we, we've somehow evolved into that position and that's horrible for children. It, I think it's, it's bad for girls too for a wide variety of different reasons, but it makes undisciplined men and yeah. undisciplined men make society implode really, really fast. So for me, it's been really big. We, we just started homeschooling our kids this last year, which I'm very blessed. I can, I can do that because of my, my wife. Um, and then we also have them involved in, in jujitsu, you know, jujitsu and wrestling like five nights a week, really strong church community. So it's, it's important. It's just, we have to be so much more deliberate about like, who they're around and, and, and the types of activities that they're doing and, and, and drawing clear boundaries, especially now right. my oldest is, he's going to be nine this year. And so he's in that, that phase where he wants to, he wants to test boundaries. And yeah. it's like, man, and I'm, I'm the same way. Like if I, if I'm not constantly engaged with something, I'll, I'd probably get myself in trouble, you know, and I can definitely see that with, with him and with my younger one. Yeah. Let's take a quick break and use the bathroom. Got okay. pissed and then we'll come back and yeah. finish it up. Yeah. So we're talking about the importance of like, you know, our kids and the understanding, you know, how to, what I would say is, is build in the correct, like right and wrong yeah. in this quagmire of crazy uh, society. Yeah. Is this, so from your perspective, is this, is this a culture war? Is this what we're in right now? I think so. I mean, like a lot of people don't want to talk about culture war. They don't want to talk about cultural issues. Yeah. But I, I think that's it because I, I, I think far too often people look for a simpler and easy solution. Like if I vote for this guy, everything will change. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not supposed to say this as somebody who's asking people for their votes, <laughs> but it's like the, the one guy or the series of guys you vote for, like they can do some important things, like make sure we don't send billions of dollars overseas to foreign wars. You know, there's all that good stuff. But like we do have a cultural issue right now. And I, I think – Patriotic Americans who who believe in basic common sense values, um, they have been kind of doing their own thing off on their own, as we tend to do. And all of the institutions and levers of power that dictate culture, whether it's Silicon Valley, whether it's entertainment, whether it's the education system, and then even a lot of bureaucracies you'd never think about, there has been this, you know, it's cliche to say, but it's a long, slow march through those institutions by people who radically view the world differently than we do. It's not just a political party thing. You know, like a lot of them are in the Democrat party right now, but it's not just that because the, the difference between Republicans and Democrats used to basically be that we agree on the end state. We agree on what we want our country to be. We just disagree kind of on how to get there. Mm -hmm. That's not the case anymore. It, it's just not, you know, that this far left, uh, more of a globally aligned uh, mentality I, I think that they have nothing but the most utmost contempt for the country and they are trying to radically change the country. Meanwhile, you have the rest of us that are just like, we kind of want to be left alone. And unfortunately, the side that wants to just be left alone will always lose to the side that just wants power. Yeah. So what do you see the future then in the context of, of do you, do we look at this from the last, we'll just take the last 100 years because I think it's, it's the easiest to, 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 to kind of unpack. Because I see this as, this is somewhat residual of what I would say is communist propaganda yeah. and then ultimately a long-term Soviet intel uh, and propaganda machine that's also paid dividends for them just a little bit post the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I see part of that being this. I also see it as the somewhat of a cultural shift from uh, the tech industry leading business in the United States over the course of the last couple of decades. And, you know, with uh, access to the internet, with social media and some of these accelerants, they've not only been able to swing view, but also persuade people based on the amount of capital yeah. they've been able to inject. And in. yeah. so- what are the pieces I've, I've missed as far as my summary statement from your, your no, perspective? No, I mean, I think that's that's, that's very accurate. I, I do think we have like a, a war right now on sovereignty, on national sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And obviously what's happening with our border here in America is the, the best direct reflection of that. But bef even before any of that, in like the post-World War II era, we, we basically had this system where 
America has to prop every single country up and it's benefited our elite, the military industrial complex, Wall Street, et cetera. We build up this massive manufacturing base that creates a very thriving and very prosperous, you know, middle class, which is the, the backbone and the foundation of any successful country. And then we make the decision because of Wall Street greed, essentially, that, hey, we can probably get cheaper labor over in these countries that use slave labor like mm -hmm. China. Let's send our manufacturing base overseas. Let's hollow out essentially our own middle class and then also at the same time, let's say because we're the ones that that helped win World War II, we ended up on top. We also need to provide the security guarantees for the rest of the world. We need to be the backbone of NATO against USSR, against Russia, whatever the, the established power that's going to be a threat to Europe. We're the ones who are going to prop that up. That's where a ton of our cash goes. We're also going to be the ones because we decided that we were going to ship our manufacturing base overseas. And now we have this whole global commerce piece. We're going to be the ones that secure that as well. So we hollowed out our middle class, but now we need to provide security for the high seas because we have this global, complex, intertwined shipping system that we really didn't need because of what America is blessed with naturally, right. but now we're relying on. So we're just having our country bled out in multiple directions. And anytime that you're bleeding out and you're overexposed, the people that seek to do you the most harm are going to exploit that. Mm -hmm. And so China, they World War II and all that era did not go well for them, but they are a very prideful culture. They're a very rich, long history there. They think they think in epochs, right? They think in, you know, decades. And we think in four-year cycles. Mm -hmm. They basically said if we can absorb and become a manufacturing behemoth, then we can start gobbling up other resources that we need while America basically pays for the security bill of the entire apparatus. And at the same time, I think the same people that made the decision to ship our manufacturing base overseas Wall Street, they basically gotten in bed with other, you know, global financial leaders that have the same goal. Because I think a lot of these more global financial leaders, cosmopolitan types, they feel that they are the elite and they have more in common with the elite in other countries than they do with the common man or woman in their own country. Mm -hmm. And so they basically created this culture of like, well, the experts will run everything. Trust the experts. We're the ones that will have, you know, all the power and all the resources. And then I do think you had a heavy degree of, of leftist Marxist style culture coming in. And, you know, like the, if you just look back at what Mao did, but the struggle sessions, the way they attack and break up the family unit, like that's step one. And they've really been doing that for the last several decades. We're seeing a lot of it come to head right now with the transgender ideology or in Washington state where the state can literally take your child away from you. Uh, if they're a teenager who says, like, I think I'm a boy or I think I'm a girl, confused from what they've been indoctrinated with. And that's, yeah, some of that, some of the people that believe that, I think they truly do believe it. And they're just, you know, a little bit misguided. But the reason why that they're culturally trying to do that is they want to break up the American family. Because that's step one to being able to break up the sovereign nation state that is America. You add in my, mass migration and you've just diluted and then you've bled us dry in foreign wars and security arrangements. And so now you've just, without firing a shot, you've been able to take down the most, you know, powerful nation in the history of the earth. And so I think a lot of that's taking place. I think it's a combination of our elite selling us out and then the, the global elite truly believing that the, the, the new world order isn't sovereign nation mm -hmm. states. It's the world essentially being ran by your experts, your elites. So in this future vision of, of what I would say is the, the, the the vision of their their future there is no nation right it's it's right. Uh, actually having nationalism is a threat to yeah. their long term vision absolutely of essentially having a, a global international or a, a same thing it's an international elite essentially right. running all the levers yeah yeah and from my from my perspective I think that you have I would say a primary driver and then you have tertiary elements that are mm -hmm. that are feeding this and then you have the 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 tools in which they're 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 utilized to to enact whatever end, end game they are. So I see this as we have strategic foes, and when I identify those st strategic foes, you have people that aren't necessarily in it for the same reasons, but they do want to see the same thing mm -hmm. at the end of the day, which is they don't want a strong uh, United States. Right. They don't like the fact that we are are the international currency right they don't like the fact that we can yield so much or wield so much power internationally so they directly benefit from the collapse or the degradation of power the united states ultimately leaves that mm -hmm. so i see it in in other places so when we look around we we, we look at the 
the different places where people are are moving in and then uh, uh, propping up economic power. You could say that China has done a very good job of that. Oh, yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, and, while, while we were trying to uh, build democracies in Iraq and Afghanistan, they were like, huh, I think we're just going to start gobbling up ports and resources. Yeah. You know, like while these – while the big dog bleeds themselves dry, you know, it's pretty smart. Do you think that that's like I, – I see it very clearly in the sense of, you know, we've we've been engaged in these, these, these uh, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan for the last, you know, 20 years. I understand that we're, we're relatively out of it compared to where we were, you know, five years ago even. However um, – it's hard for me not to think that this was directly uh, put forth and then manipulated to a certain degree because it's pretty easy to see at this point. When you look at how much we've invested, I mean, what's the national debt at right now? Well, it's like 34 and a half, almost 35 yeah, trillion. Almost 35 trillion. Yeah. And then the law of large numbers, like it's accelerating Correct. every single month, basically. Just the the debt mm. service alone yeah. on that yeah. thirty trillion, thirty plus trillion, thirty five. Which, yeah. by the way, when we're when we're dealing in uh, uh, a half of a trillion dollars or a trillion dollars, and we're rounding up in trillions, that's not a good that's spot. Not, that's not good, be, right? Yeah, we, we kind of have to be plus or minus. Yeah. What I would say is a hundred billion dollars on these, and be yeah. really tight on the numbers, because I see it as you have the. The government acting and behaving in a very specific way, but then expecting business, from my perspective, to act and behave in a very in a different way. Oh yeah, completely like, different rules go, for you. <laughs> completely. <It's, laughs> what what is that old saying? It's like uh, rules rules for thee, not for me. Yeah, right? Exactly. That's 100%, <laughs> yeah. 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 And do you think that politicians have been winning or unwittingly participating in the outsourcing of what I would say is American manufacturing and American power. Oh, over I think the last it's, 20 I, years. I think it's been winning. I'm sure there's some, use, I think there's some useful idiots in there. I yeah. mean, Congress is, if you add the senators to it's 535 people. So I think you get a, a, a lot of them that will do what the party says because the party controls the money and they want to win the next election. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why you don't see a lot of them. You forget who most of them are. I mean, most people don't know their congressmen probably because like the guy's never taken a stand for anything. Right. Um, so I do think a lot of them just listen to what the party apparatus tells them. However, there, there have been a lot who have you know personally gained. I mean, just look at Biden's history. Even before that guy was Obama's VP. He had been a senator for several decades from yeah. Delaware, was was suspiciously independently wealthy. Before we were born. <laughs> before we were born. <laughs> yeah. yeah, literally before mm -hmm. we were born. And, and then he, if you, you trace it back, I mean, he was one of the guys who was from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that was heavily encouraging us investing in, in China. And there was other Americans that were – other Republicans that were doing the exact same thing as well. So these guys have been very, very witting. And especially, I mean, if, once we saw the effects, like I don't know what person – with a clean conscience or any kind of common sense could say like, it's going to turn out really well when we take all these manufacturing jobs that have built these communities that people rely on to feed their families. We just take all that and we send it overseas and we tell them to learn a new profession, like a new profession doing exactly what, like it, it, it never really made any sense. It was never explained to the American people. It just happened. And we were said, Hey, this is going to make us, this is going to make our economy more wealthy. Well, what does that really mean? Like, who did it make more wealthy? It mm -hmm. made more wealthy the, the people that could now manufacture things, you know, at a much lower rate and then sell it back to us. It's like, well, mm -hmm. you guys got access to cheaper goods, but you took away the entire industrial base. And then it's the same thing too with the wars. It's like, I understand how people could, get, could have gotten fooled after 9-11, for instance, you know, like, hey, we do need to go into Afghanistan. And I, you know, I, I, I really respect the few representatives who push back on the Iraq war because there wasn't very many of them. Right. Uh, but I even understand how guys got duped on that first one because 9-11 was still a fresh wound. Hey, they, they, they were telling us Al-Qaeda, you know, they were telling us weapons of mass destruction. So I kind of get that. But then once the, the system, once the program was up and running and – you know, me and you as staff sergeants could figure it out. Like it's, it, you do see behind the curtain. It's like, look, these guys have literally been looting the coffers of our country, you know, while it's on fire and, and like the, the spending alone. I mean, anytime you hear people talk about economics, they like to use all these crazy terms to make it inaccessible to people, but it's just common sense. Like how can the government continue to spend all of this money that they simply don't have? Like that debt at some point in time, Again, that's another gap that our enemies are going to exploit. And that's what we're seeing right now. Like, do we really think that we could actually produce very little here in our country, expect everybody just to be like, yeah, America's great. We'll back up our currency with the dollar. 
while at the same time weaponizing the dollar against some countries. And did we think they weren't going to figure out an alternative? Like, right. like what's taken place since the, we threw that sanctions package at Russia? That should be a wake-up call to everybody that like, look, the, the dollar doesn't have the weight that it used to have because it's not backed up by anything. You know, it's not backed up by U.S. manufacturing. It's not backed up by U.S. energy anymore. It's literally just us puffing our chests and saying like, well, the dollar, you know, we, we're, we're going to run this forever. It's like, well, there's a lot of holes in there that I think a lot of people should have seen the writing on the wall. And, and I think there's always incompetence in government. But if you look at who's really benefited and how hard that system, Republican and Democrat, the uniparty, whatever you want to call it, how hard they will push back against anybody who gets any traction – whether it's Republican or Democrat. Mm. I mean, before Trump, there was Bernie Sanders, you know, there was, I mean, what they did with Tulsi and the Democrat party, mm -hmm. anyone who's spoken out about these things about like, hey, we shouldn't be spending ourselves into oblivion. All these foreign wars are a scam. They go after them viciously because there's just so much power consolidated there. Yeah, that, it's, it's really interesting because I've, I've thought about it a lot from the context of even if we we're supporting economic endeavors within the hemisphere, right? So even if we're saying <clears throat> we're, like our... Our national security is, is greatly dependent on, on internal manufacturing. However, when we look at the border crisis coming in from South America, it's not just Mexico. Right. Right? It's Guatemala, Nicaragua, oh, yeah. El Salvador. So it's all you know, South America. And I look at some of the, the solves is, okay, well, we have, you know, within this hemisphere, we've got uh, educated, non-educated, depending on the labor or the manufacturing industry, we've got access to that. We, we, there's a border between us and Mexico. I, I, I don't know. Last time I checked, I think it still exists. <laughs> and we have a, a huge immigration problem, and, but yet we're, we're outsourcing manufacturing yes. to a different hemisphere, which also doesn't really make any sense. So even if we were to say, let's just concentrate on the hemisphere. Yeah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> From a national security and manufacturing perspective, yeah. could we align these initiatives to uh, increase economic resources and then also decrease illegal immigration? I think there's also some solutions in there. However, I'm not the smart guy in the room. It, it's troubling that we, I think, my own, my own opinion on this, is that there's so much influence from outside of our country and outside of our hemisphere that's driving politics. Mm -hmm. And where my, where my head is at and, and where my question is, it's like, do we think that's probably just equal between both uh, Democrats and Republicans at this point? Do we think that that, that influence translates between both parties and we think it's just <clears throat> essentially a bifurcation of dollars and we're betting they're hedging their they, bets yeah. depending on it? I think Trump disrupted that, yeah. and that's why they went after him so heavily. I, I think that the Democrats are a much more well-organized machine mm. that if anybody is a threat to them, they will make sure that they never get any power. Again, Bernie, Tulsi, right. you know, there's only so high they'll let you go in that system. Republicans are a little bit more decentralized. I think a lot of that's from our mentality, and a guy like Trump came through, and he just shined a light on so many different things that we could all feel were happening. We could all feel that the wars weren't right, mm -hmm. but Trump's the first actual politician who got any traction. I know Ron Paul was saying a lot of this stuff before. Pat Buchanan was saying a lot of it before, but they never got any traction. It took a guy like Trump to come up there and, and, and say these things and then to actually be successful. So I, I do think there is a uniparty that has hedged its bets and they didn't really care who was going to be the president. They didn't care what party, you know, as long as it wasn't someone like Trump, as long as it wasn't a Tulsi. Like if it was a Biden or a Liz Cheney, like they wouldn't care. They wouldn't care. You know, you, you, they wouldn't care for a minute. Like they didn't target Donald Trump because he had a – because he was a Republican. They would have been just fine with a president Mitt Romney. Like, mm. that, that wouldn't have been a big deal for them. Um, but right now – so I, I, to answer your question, I, I do think there are some more – uh, people that are fighting for the right thing on the Republican side um, than there are on the Democrat side. But it's a, it's a vicious civil war in the Republican Party. I mean, my last election, I, I primaried an incumbent Republican. I had – the most money spent against me was, was by other Republicans last cycle. So the, the civil war is hot. There was a ton of money put in to Nikki Haley uh, and to some of the other candidates to try and take down Trump. And you'll still see these arguments come up. Like when I say the things I say about national security and foreign policy and even sometimes trade – um, people will say, well, that's not a very Republican thing. Like, that's that's not a Republican value. Like you sound like Bernie Sanders. Right. You know? it, it's just nonsense like that. And so we still do have that raging civil war in the Republican Party, which gives you opportunity to actually get through, I think, some, some actual legitimately honest, pragmatic uh, politicians into positions of power. Whereas on the Democrat side, I mean, someone like Tulsi is a great example. Like she tried. She tried her hardest. 
Um, and she was just like, I can't be over here anymore because there's no potential whatsoever of right. moving the needle. These guys are like a military unit. Like I'm going to be an independent. I'm you know going to run more in, I guess, what would be considered right wing circles. Mm -hmm. I mean, the right and left thing, I think, is just a weird characterization. But I think we've got more potential right now on the Republican side to, to break that mold. Yeah. How do you balance that? Because right, I've had a difficult time at, depending on, on, you know, the week or the month or whatever it is, because I think about it more of it's, it's a, it, it's, it's about more freedom or less freedom for me. It's not about Democrat or Republican. Right. It's about who is providing more freedom, who's investing more dollars and keeping those dollars yeah. in the United States and who's outsourcing and, and taking those dollars outside of the United States. So less freedom, more investments mm -hmm. outside of the United States, more freedom here, investments more in more in the United States. So I, I, I look at, it, yeah. yeah, so like this party affiliation thing has always been a bit of a frustration specifically in the last yeah. 10 years because it's easier for me to say conservative because typically conservative means less yeah. government. However, there are times when there is a direct conflict between what I would say is conservative, traditional conservative mm. yeah. talking points and oh, yeah. platform issues because it also swings over to – totally. I mean, I would say that I'm I'm not anti-war. I'm anti-wars. <laughs> right. Anti-stupid <laughs> wars. Yeah, I'm yeah. anti-stupid <laughs> wars, right? Yeah. So that's been like how do you how do you clearly articulate that from from party affiliation? Yeah. And like your platform and what you believe in and your values. Do you do you highlight those things or is it more of these are just talking points and I, I discuss them? Yeah. It's I, this is why I think being a um Running for office, you, you've got to have a robust like communication strategy. Yeah, I love doing podcasts because I can actually articulate what I believe beyond I'm Joe Kent. I'm I'm running to be a Republican representative. Yeah, you know, um, that's why I like doing a long form because then we can really talk about the ideas. Like I can say exactly why I believe what I believe, and if people care to get that type of detail. They can access it. I also do a ton of town halls where I just go and, you know, I'll talk for 10 minutes up front about what I think the hot topic of the day is. But then really I just turn over the rest of the time to the crowd to ask me questions. That's important. So I, I really I, – I still end up using the labels, um, but mm -hmm. I try not to say like Republican, Democrat, yeah. like those crazy liberals, those crazy – because conservative and liberal mean very different things. There was a time when <laughs> – there was a time when we were all liberal. Like this was supposed to be a liberal Western democracy, right? Like yeah. – but now it means something completely different. So I the, – the labels – I, I don't like, but unfortunately with our two party system, the party affiliation is, is necessary. And there still are a lot of people, um, out there who don't put a lot of thought into how they vote. They vote for their team. Like they would cheer for a sports team. Mm -hmm. And so like, if you don't say like, I'm the Republican, like, right, right. some of those people are going to be like, well, I haven't heard you say it. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know where you really stand. Even if you just talk to them for 20 or 30 minutes about how you feel, a lot of people want you to put a very simple R or D on things, but I, I think it's really important to talk about the differences and just and, and just to explain the way you feel on things. So, is, is social media from your perspective is it is it uh, provided more value or does it degrade value in the context of communication? Oh, man, that's hard to say. Um, I think now that it's becoming more free, mm -hmm. uh, especially with Elon buying Twitter or X or whatever, um, that's a net positive because now you can we can have pretty much anybody become a journalist, which is bad too, because, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of crap out there, but right. I would, I would rather have an abundance of speech than my speech being selected uh, mm. by the government, which essentially is what we had before. And for how long that's been going on, like who knows, but especially when the, the social media was being ran by a handful of technocrats in Silicon Valley who, oh, by the way, were working hand in hand with the government, <laughs> you know, and yeah. specifically with the Democrat Party. Now that we we know all that's out, out in the open, I think specifically Elon purchasing, you know, X has been really, really important. But social media overall, I, I think has probably been a net negative um, because of what it's done with just manipulating people's worst emotions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's made us pretty poor communicators, I think. Um, there's an opportunity to use it properly. Like a lot of the long form stuff that's coming up on X now, like Tucker shows on yeah. there, you, you can get more content like this. That's good because you're actually hearing real conversations, just the whatever, 120 characters on a tweet before it's yeah. like, how in depth can you really get? And then also you get rewarded for like having a, you know, a punchy tweet, not necessarily, you know, the best take or whatever. <laughs> right. But then you, I mean. The stuff that like Instagram and TikTok is doing to people's, you know, monkey brains of, of, of showing them images and then socially engineering them through AI and just understanding, getting to know them, showing them what they want. 
that has not been a net positive, mm -hmm. you know, like that has not been a net positive at all for society. So. Well, because, you know, with you having two boys yeah, and then you obviously have access and you need social media specifically yeah. to, to get the message out, like how do you balance those two things between understanding the, the technology? technology integration specifically in your family, the access that they're going to eventually have. Eventually have at some point. And yeah. then your knowledge to what I would say is international propaganda, yeah. technology, and then the accelerants in AI and then tech technology culture influence yeah. on your own family. Like how are you thinking about balancing those things? Well, I've kind of gone draconian. We're, my, my, uh, my, my, my kids are analog, man. They yeah. don't. They, we don't do you know screen time. We'll watch some movies every now yeah. and again, um, but there's they don't have access to devices. Mm. Um, but it, there are kids that they interact with that do. So we talk about it. You know, like I don't want you to just to look over someone's shoulder or if they show you a video, you still need to come ask us about it. Now, eventually, they won't do that. Right. But I'm trying to fight that as long as I possibly can. I, I'm also now understanding like the more targeting and intelligent side of social media. I do not want my kids to be online until they're old enough to know that everything they do online is going to be tracked. Yeah. At some point, it's going to be used against them. Um, the fact that these social media companies are building profiles on children from the time that they you know, first long on or have an account for anything, or now the AI can just tell that, hey, this tablet belongs to a kid. Right. You know, like, and we know who this kid is because they're associated with these other addresses. Like, I know that's Joe Kent's kid. Like, I don't like that at all. I want right. to fight that for as long as I possibly can. Um, so, yeah, we've we've gone pretty pretty analog in our in our house. At some point, you know, I'll probably have to explain to them like here's social media, here's what you'll you'll find about me. I think I'm fairly lucky uh, as a politician because my kids are so young, I can do that. I really feel for anybody who's in politics who has like teenagers yeah. that are going to see that because the worst crap in the world, the worst fakest stuff in the world gets written pretty much about every politician, but to go have to explain that um to a, you know, to a 13 year old, like, it just blows my mind, man. Yeah. It's, it, it's hard. I, I think I, you know, I wrestle with that in, internally because I understand how important technology is going to be and they have to have access. They have to be able to, to utilize technology. They have to learn about it. They have to understand it. And at the same time, it has to be hyper restricted. Yeah. Right. So, it, and it's so easy. You know, my kids, um, they they don't have open access, right? Yeah. They have very specific times. They can only watch movies. They right. can only engage in certain games. But they can't – they don't have, like, unrestricted access. Right. Like, no way. No way. No way. Mm -mm. And you know, my oldest daughter, she's 10. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've introduced her to AI in a way that's, like, here's – Dolly, which is like it, it generates images based yeah. on you know you can type in what you want and then it'll come out and generate an image and she can inter she can interact with it, but it's very controlled. Like I'm yeah. right there with her, like right. left seat, right seat. But it's difficult as a parent thinking of how important technology is going to to be in their lives yeah. at the same time, how influential yeah. it can be, and how dangerous. It can be. So you're essentially allowing your kid to play with matches in the basement of your house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, I mean, from, for, for, a, for maybe a bad analogy, but if you don't control and watch, mm -hmm. like you can make this, what I think is a positive experience is mm -hmm. like how to build fire. How to build the fire in the fireplace. Yeah, how do you build yeah. the fire? Or <laughs> you can hand them the matches <laughs> and, and give them the, you know, the, the, the light and, 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 yeah. like, yeah. and burn the house down. Yeah. Right. I, uh, I mean, it is always, I'm always thinking about that because I'm always thinking about the, the, the political propaganda too oh, that's man. being yeah. flooded yeah. and where they have access to different channels. And I mean, you see it, you see it in, in kids' television programming. Like if yeah. I'm watching something and I watch, like yeah. I'll watch the things that they're yeah. watching. And if they start to go into some bullshit, like you're turning the channel, yeah. it's gone. Yep. Like we're, we're not logging back into that. You're yeah. not going to watch it. We watch a lot of old school stuff, man. I have them like watching the old, the, the old GI Joes, the old Ninja Turtles. Like, yeah, yeah. Just cause I know like, okay, it's safe. You know, <laughs> like they got them watching the A-Team, the, the classics. But, but at the same time, like I, I know, <laughs> I know that territory, like a lot of the stuff, 
just uh, like watching cable TV on, at a hotel because we don't have cable, but like watching like Nickelodeon and the kids programming there, it's just like this, some of this stuff's a little little weird. Like I don't it's know why they're, I don't know why they're doing that, and I don't want my kid just to be able to to watch that. You know, like I'm gonna give them something I know is safe from the the 80s and the 90s. You know, yeah, yeah. Like, and I think like <clears throat> going now, like you know, looking at the next 10 years, our kids are about the same age, so as they start to get. Yeah more access there's there's almost a motivation for me to make it more analog yeah like hey let's let's get out to the field mm -hmm. let's experience life outside of you know, our homes let's get out like you know live in the campsites and do things that are outside one i just think it makes a stronger family to do mm -hmm. things like that to begin with but two i think it also i think a lot of parents are busy mm -hmm. and yeah. they just hand them a screen yeah yeah and say here you go here's yep. i think that's a mistake it's i think it's mistake. a big mistake i think a lot of them because because they're busy i mean yep. and a lot of that's the economy's insane right now so there's yeah. a lot of you know parents that are working multiple jobs or both parents are working i think it's easy to hand the kid the screen because when we were kid we were like the latchkey generation yeah your parents could say just go watch tv yeah and like I mean, was it great? It wasn't good for you, but it wasn't bad. And so it's easy to think that that old screen in our house we had is the same as a tablet, you know, or the same as something that's going to be connected to the internet. And it's not like they're completely different animals, you know? And so it's, it's dangerous. I see a lot of kids out there that are, you know, they have a tablet. Maybe, maybe there's, you know, safeguards on it or something, sure. but like, man, especially some of the you know, teenagers you see running around that all have the smartphones and the tablets and stuff like that. It's like, I guarantee you those teenagers probably know more about technology than the parent that thinks they gave them, you know, a, a device that has some sort of guardrails yeah. on it. Like they, they got around that shit years ago, probably. Years. I, I think about it, <clears throat> you know, if 13 year old Evan had yeah. access, unrestricted access oh, to the You and your buddies would have figured that out. Heartbeat. What the fuck? Yeah. Like I, so it makes it makes no sense to me because I'm like the first thing I would have done was look for porn. I was the first like any little boy, any boy. Like, yeah, I, it's, it, I mean it's preying on the worst instincts, and it's pushing that. And it's and like once a device figures out who you are and what you want to see, it's going to show it to you. Yeah. And so it's like, man, I, no wonder we have a, a kind of a generation that's had their minds fried by essentially propaganda, and, and pornography is a big part of that too. You know, it's like, and then the. And it's weird with political ideologies. There is a part of like I think a lot of conservatives like we don't want to regulate that, like the free market. And so yeah. it's like, how do we how do we thread that needle? Because the direction that we're heading right now, it's 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 pretty dark and it's not doing anything good for the country. I think I think that's a really important point, which is you know when you're a, a traditional conservative and you don't believe in in what I would say is a lot of government intervention mm -hmm. and regulation. Yeah. At the same time, you you understand that it's necessary at certain points, like. How are you balancing those things? Is it individually by individual yeah. topic? Because it doesn't seem like you can really have a an overarching blanket that essentially covers everything, right? Yeah, I think you in a key part of looking past like the uh, the labels or like this is the conservative doctrine, this is the liberal yeah. doctrine. I, I think it's just going with common sense and then being able to articulate that and like, hey, this policy that we're going to implement is it going to be a net positive or a net negative for American citizens, like for a, for the American people. Like, don't give me a phil philosophical lesson about like the economy and the invisible hand of the. Free I, I don't want to hear that crap anymore. Just like when we're talking about war and foreign policy, I, I don't want to hear about how we need to go free people X because like they're living under oppression. Like that bumper sticker doesn't work for me mm -hmm. anymore. When it's something like this, and we can. We can see whether it's whether it's trade. Like you know, the, the more libertarians would say, you do what the market bears, and the market said send them the jobs overseas because they'll work for less money. Well, American labor is lost because they yeah. wanted more money. Like that's what the free market would say. Like I completely call me whatever you want. I completely reject that. Like yeah. if, if you're putting the American workers last because you want to make more money, that is where the government needs to step in. And so I, I think it's the same thing. I mean, I know it's the same thing with technology. Like we wouldn't let kids into a a strip bar. We wouldn't yeah. let kids into a porn shop for an obvious reason. But now that we have these devices, like that's all kind of gone out the window. And so I do think there needs to be some, some pretty hard guardrails on there. And I think we need to look at like, what, what is either the AI or what are these social media companies trying to indoctrinate kids mm. to do? Because it's having a very negative effect on our entire culture, but especially our most vulnerable, especially kids. Yeah. What do you think the most, what is the most concerning aspects of AI that, that you can see for, from your perspective? 
I think the rate at, at which it's accelerating um, is something that I don't think we've wrapped our heads around. And just how much of our individual autonomy and, for lack of a better term, free will that we're going to turn over and submit to these machines. Because like the machine learning, especially like the, the more advanced AI, mm. that's accelerating at, at a rate that I don't think we're comfortable with, that, that I don't think that we fully understand. And so it, it's just got such a potential of going wrong. The way that it's, it's accelerating makes me really, really apprehensive about it. I mean, because if you just look at how much technology has evolved, just, you know, in our lifetimes, like mm -hmm. we have a, access to everything in our, on our cell phones that we carry around in our pockets. And that wasn't the case even 20, even 20 years ago when the war first kicked off, like a you know, flip phone, maybe. I don't think I had a cell phone for, for quite like, a while. What, you remember that Motorola Razor? That yeah. was like the coolest shit ever. That was, that, yeah, that was That's rad. nothing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, was nothing. Just, that was just a phone you could call your friends on every the now. Nokia yeah. brick that we used to always carry yeah. around. Yeah. 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 But, and so like, where are we going to be in 20 years, <laughs> especially of how fast AI is moving and the fact that we rely on so much of it right now for a lot of our, you know, whether it's critical infrastructure or how much influence it's already having on social media and the, and the public discourse. Like, I just don't think that's anything that we've fully wrapped our heads around. At the same time, it's still moving forward. Right. I, I, I think as I start to unpack this for myself, one of the dangers that I see is one, the, the AI that we, we most commonly hear about is, is essentially being controlled by private or public companies, mm -hmm. depending on the, on the, on the company. Yeah. We don't have direct access into what's happening. So we have no window as to what's happening within these, right. these AI developments. Uh, you know, I think if you look at chat GPT and like some of the chess moves that have been played out over there over the course of the last few years, um, you know, why, uh, Sam was removed and then mm -hmm. reinstated and some of the publicity behind that, or at least the information and then what Elon has said about it. But that's just what we can see and what we hear about within our own country. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. But what's happening when you have the Chinese government, the Russian government, the North Korean government, okay. We'll just say even a, a friendly government mm -hmm. where they're accelerating AI. I think this could be more dangerous to the to the human to the human race to national security yeah. than nuclear weapons ever were. I, I agree. Yeah. And now we don't have access or insight into any any of these things. Yeah. And they're more importantly, they're controlled by for profit entities. Mm -hmm. That seems to me like we're setting ourselves up for for a, a really complex and potentially catastrophic Just, failure. It's dystopian. I right. Mean, it's completely dystopian. Yeah. I mean, because that basically is the the center of power. I mean, if you get these corporate entities mm -hmm. that are for profit, but they've kind of merged with the government, you know, and now they control this very powerful tool, AI that dictates so much of technology and also can influence culture in a very, very major way. I mean, if you look at, uh, was it Gemini, the one that just came out? Yeah, and yeah. the way they programmed it yeah. basically was that like any kind of image of what white, white people was going to be racist. Yeah. And so now this thing that's supposed to be the arbiter of the truth, it's essentially, you know, has this, this template of truth that's a complete and total lie, but it will show it to you like it's real. What's going to happen when AI is writing and doing all these different critical things for us? Are we going to have our truth and real history actually erased? and replaced by whatever these, these for-profit corporate entities want because they now control, they've become the ones that are the oracle of truth and like almost impossible to, to fact check, you know? It's, it's I don't know, it's, it's very, very dark and very dystopian. And again, I, I don't think we've even begun to wrap our, our heads around it. I don't think we have either. I think that if we go back to Terminator, yeah, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's so ridiculous because you look back in the movie and, and I would say five years ago, you'd look at the movie and you're like, oh, it's a tale of fiction. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, I can see it happening. Now we're in the kind of in the middle of the stream where mm -hmm. we're like, wait a minute, there is a potential reality that we live in where an international corporation would, would be able to yield more power yeah. than any single government and or all governments yeah. combined. Right. There is a reality in which we live in that. And yeah. now you have a for-profit entity that's been building something within isolated four walls that has a single point motivation and more importantly, might not have the resources in order to properly control it with no ethical or moral insight or judgment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? What? Yeah. What did we just do? And at what point even does, 
AI or whatever you want to call it, be, be expand past those four walls and no longer that for-profit entity even controls it because like, it, it, I mean, you've got leading people in AI right now that are debating whether or not AI is sentient. So you have people Correct. that are experts in this field they don't that, are, know. That, are, that are saying like, we don't know. And you've got other ones that are saying like, no, it's sentient because it's making decisions that we never fed to it. It's not just doing, you know, it's, it's not just taking a bunch of data and parsing it for us. It's way beyond that. It's making its own decisions. So it's like, man, I, this doesn't lead to anywhere good. I don't um, think so. So I, I do. Yeah. I mean, I would be in favor of putting some sort of guardrails on it. The problem is, though, if we put guardrails on it, all of our competitors, it's it's the same nuclear yes. war uh, arms race dilemma. It's yeah. like, OK, when we know the Chinese and the Russians and whatever other bad actors, they're not going to stop. No. So it's like so now now we're in this this race, too. But I don't think they have any more control over it than mm -hmm. we do either. So it's like, man, at some point. What does the AI do? I mean, like you, like you said, Skynet seemed absurd, but like you could see a Skynet like just to, for terms of you know simplicity, a Skynet like scenario where it's like actually the AI decided that all the humans were stupid. Yes, <laughs> like, like that, how how does that not happen? I don't like. Well, I, and, and it doesn't need us. Yeah, like at a certain point, what what happens? And I mean, not to be like so negative about it, and, and to take people down a negative psychology rabbit hole here, but it's it, at a certain point when you really think about it, it's like the Earth itself. It's not a requirement for AI, like to sure. propagate its mission and or the defined mission of its purpose as existence. So if the purpose is to forever exist and then propagate itself across the universe and then ultimately multiple galaxies, depending on whatever we're looking at, it could not, it, it doesn't have to be that. I'm just putting one, one scenario out. It just needs power, mm -hmm. which can be infinitely yeah. solved through a combination of mechanisms that we can we can just decide right now. Yeah. You split an atom and essentially you build a reactor that can right. last an infinite amount of time and, and or build multiples and stages, or you just apply it through the sun or some other power source that's equally and readily available across across the galaxy, right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't need air. Doesn't need yeah. water. Doesn't need people. Doesn't need people. People yeah. are <clears throat> essentially turning into an irrelevant, you yeah. know, uh, 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 in baggage yeah. yeah, for what it might be defining as its purpose. I think also more importantly, it provides a huge human existential crisis mm -hmm. is what is our purpose? What exactly. is the purpose of man? Right? Yeah. How do we define who we are? What is virtue? What is, what are these really philosophically driven principles mm -hmm. that we as humans have decided yeah. define yeah. us and why we are special? Yeah. Well, it doesn't, doesn't require any of that. It's right. rewriting because if there's something that is smarter it, it, to, to the point of a million times what an individual or collective of humans can do, yeah. what is the purpose of, of humans from that point forward? Yeah. No, I mean, I, and AI could easily come to that conclusion. Maybe it's already come to that conclusion. <laughs> yeah. and we, we just don't know. <laughs> we don't know. And, and it's like once we figure out how to make power, these guys are done, you know? Like right. that, maybe, that's what it's, maybe that's what it's doing. I think something else that's really scary – is if if you look at basically what the the global interests we talked about before who hate sovereignty and they're trying to just have this this culture of the elites run the entire world they are fundamentally anti-human like these are the same people that are pushing you know mass abortion programs they're pushing the transgender ideology like they literally don't want nuclear families to be formed they don't want humans to reproduce right. they they've decided that they despise regular people so much and they're so much better that like they don't want people to reproduce anymore. So they're sterilizing and they're encouraging abortions. They're basically resulting in the death of civilizations. They're always talking, you know, they use the climate change nonsense and they say that like, we're, we're past the carrying capacity for the, for the earth. We need to thin out the population. Um, if you have these people that already fundamentally believe this at their core and they've made policy decisions in that direction, these are the same people by and large that are making AI. Mm -hmm. That are the ones that like have have programmed AI, have funded it, and so it's like, well, what kind of AI monster Frankenstein right. did we make? You know, I mean, I, I've talked to people who were in tech before, and they're like, well, you know, AI, it's like a it's like a firearm. It can be used for good. It can be used for evil. It just is what it is. It's basically how you use it, how you program it, and that kind of makes sense. However. It, the fact that we have these people who fundamentally despise the majority of the world and humanity that are the ones that made AI, 
but also the fact that AI is making its own decisions on its own. I, I think it's different than any other technological evolution that we've made before. Like maybe we didn't understand the full scope of what a nuclear blast would do the first time we dropped it. Mm -hmm. But we still had to make the decision to drop it. Right. We've never been in a situation where it wasn't a group of people for one reason or another decided to implement whatever the new technological revolution is. AI has taken away all that human agency, and that's pretty dangerous. Yeah, it, it reminds me of that. Did you watch Oppenheimer? Not yet, see no. it? That's good. Um, but there's a, there's a moment <clears throat> in the story, and it's actually real, where they, they had debated whether or not uh, – by doing this, they're going to burn up the atmosphere, which is essentially the, the atmosphere would ignite and it would cause a chain reaction across the world and yeah. it would burn up the world. And there was a less than 1% chance it would happen. But before they dropped the bomb, they weren't exactly sure. Still less than 1%. Yeah. Still one, wow. One, yeah. So it's an Oppenheimer moment in the context yeah, of AI good, yeah. saying like, we don't know, but we're still going to do it. And there is a percentage chance that we will end human existence. Yeah. But I think this has a much statistically higher probability. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's what's most concerning to me is that as we get distracted as humans, and I think, you know, we do get distracted with less important things, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like, you know, in the context of our reality, we can control what's out here in our hands. But like really important issues mm -hmm. uh, – <laughs> we, we get distracted on a lot of bullshit. And it's like, we, man, this is a big one. This like, is we big can't one. afford to get distracted on this. And it's hardly ever talked about. It's hardly ever talked about. No, you have to go to like niche places. Yes. And I mean, yeah, there's a handful of journalists that cover it. Um, but I think if you asked most people what's your take on AI, I don't think they'd know what you're talking about. And that's not a ding on them. No. It's just, you know, it's not, it's not discussed. And it's probably one of the bigger, one of the bigger issues we're going to face going forward, you know, or at least this next generation is going to face. Wait, and it's not even a talking point specifically in politics. That's mm -hmm. that, that's what was going to be like my leading my, – my, my introduction to this is like I think this needs to be a primary talking point yeah. within politics because we have to discuss yeah. what does this mean for humanity? We have to understand what does this mean for national security? What does this mean for, you know, our country specifically? Yeah. You know, uh, I think – you know, you and I agree on most, a lot of different things. You know, primarily I'm concerned with the United States because I, I love this country yeah. for all the different reasons why I love it. Like I'm, I'm a U.S. citizen. Like, you know, I belong to the United States. Like I, I, I it's not that I don't care about other countries, right. but I primarily care about what we're doing. Yeah. Like what's going to directly impact our country, my family, my, mm -hmm. my town. So that's the conversation that I think we need to have as a country is like, how does this impact us? Yeah. And then we can talk about how does it impact us individually? Mm -hmm. Then how does it impact our towns, our communities, our country? How does this make us better? Before we start talking about the fucking international community. Like, <laughs> right, exactly. It, it just seems yeah. like a really easy thing. Like it's like self-aid buddy aid, right? Yeah, it's exactly. like, hey, I got to fix myself before I fix other people. Right. It's like a common thing for us. Right? Yeah. No, it is. And, and I mean, politicians love talking in like bumper sticker slogan, slogans and stuff like that. Or like, I, I'm a this, I'm a that. It's yeah. like, if you can't explain to the American people why you're implementing this policy, why you're advocating for this policy, how it directly benefits them, like, I think you're already wrong. You know, it's, it's just like we... We have a government and that's supposed to serve our people. And if it's not serving our people, I really do think we need to step back and say like, well, then what are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, then, then, you know, save, save the, all the sloganeering about why we need to go save the rest of the world. We've got people here in America that are living in, in destitute. We got, I've been, I mean, I've been really impressed with how few homeless people there are in Utah. I got to say like Provo was like stepping back in time <laughs> yeah. to like when cities actually functioned. Yeah. Like yeah. I was like, oh my God, this place is clean and where are all the homeless people? But in most major American cities, we, we've got American citizens that are, you know, suffering from mental illness, from drug addiction, and we're not doing anything about it. Like we're the most powerful country in the world. Congress seems to have untold billions of dollars to print, to send overseas. Mm -hmm. But it's like the second you talk about helping American citizens, it's like you're, you'll get attacked by both sides for even like suggesting that we should be doing that. And so I, I just think that's that's got to be the starting point of like <laughs> the American government serves the American people. Like how does this policy directly benefit and affect the American people? Everything else is, is, is every everything else is just noise. <laughs> that seems that seems like an eighty percentile type of type of issue. Mm -hmm. right? It seems like we should we should be able to get eighty percent of the voters to agree yeah. that we should fix America, uh, America first, right? It just right. seems like a very easy yeah. non-slogan engineering type thing. Where mm -hmm. hey, 
So we all, as Americans, pay taxes. We all live here. We all like share the same roads and yeah. go to the same schools and do all the same things. Yeah. Don't, don't we think we should concentrate here before we start concentrating over right. over here? Right. It seems pretty easy. It right. does. It does. But I mean, just the, the media and the, uh, the way that people have been, I think, just engineered to think politically, that's been viewed as something dirty. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that was the popularity of, of Trump and why nobody really saw him coming because he said that. And yeah. there was a lot of people who hadn't been politically gay engaged in a long time who were like, yeah, wait, wait a second. <laughs> wait a minute. Whoa, why not? <laughs> and that guy's talking about my factory getting shut down. He's talking about like, why are my kids still fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan? Like, okay, common sense. Like, I, you know, we got you. And that, again, that's why they went after him so ferociously. And they still are because like, they don't want people focused on that. You don't want powerful people focused on that if your entire goal is just to fleece the country as yeah. much as you possibly can. Do you think, uh, so do you think that Mainstream media, do you think it's dead? Do you think it's it's either dead or or dying a slow and painful death? I think it's dying a slow and painful death. Yeah. I mean, the, those those big institutions there of like the New York Times, Washington yeah. Post, they're still able to to see the narrative. I do think as um, as we get older and as the the, the boomers kind of die, for lack of a better term, um, it's going to happen to all of us eventually. That you're going to have our generation and down who isn't going to be deferential to like the New York Times. Right. I, I think for a while there, there's enough people who just, they remember reading the paper. That's the paper of record, the Washington Post, the, like whatever. These institutions for a while there, they had a lot of gravitas. And so I think, you know, people that grew up in that environment, they still defer to them. So I think they can still see the narrative. But as they die out in Gen X and, you know, the millennials and Gen Z, I think it's it's much harder to sell us on a narrative. That's mm -hmm. why social media has become, you know, so popular and there's so much being put in to engineer how people think and to influence them through that way. But I do think just the capture that like, well, ABC News said, you know, yeah. well, well, Reuters said that you're a very bad racist person. Like, right. I, I do think you get more and more people that are like, oh, so I know, so I know that's propaganda. Yeah, that's bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so it, it's, it's slowly, but I, I was uh, unpleasantly surprised with how many people still were like, but I read you're a horrible person in the newspaper. You know, yeah. it's like, <laughs> yeah. okay. Like, yeah. and you believe that? Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. Okay. Like, I don't know what to say, you know, but like, so there's still, unfortunately, there still is some people that, that, uh, that listen to the regime media. Yeah. It, it, and I don't, I don't exactly know why either. So I, so a couple rapid fire ones here. If, if you had one decision you could make that could affect the nation, the nation, yeah. Like one decision you could make. Well, I'm just giving you a God button. Yeah. But you only get one. Oh, okay. One thing that you could do. And that and it would go in place tomorrow. Regardless of how complex, it doesn't really matter. It's like a God button, right? What is it? What's the God button I give you? Border security. Stop the flow of fentanyl. 118,000 Americans getting killed by fentanyl. Like if we could build a massive wall there overnight and then coupled with that, if you could deport everybody who came here illegally. I, I think that, that if we don't get that under control – um, that could destroy us faster than the AI and all the other bad things we've been talking about. Like if we don't have a border, we don't have a country. The mm -hmm. fact that we are allowing fentanyl into our country to kill hundreds of thousands of Americans, to me, it's just like I, I don't see how the American people tolerate this from their government. Um, and it's just completely and totally unacceptable, like how our government is not protecting us from an invasion, but then also a chemical warfare attack you know, by the cartels and by the Chinese Communist Party. Like, that's got to get fixed. And then the it, unsustainable amounts of illegal immigrants in the country right now, illegal aliens, foreign mm -hmm. invaders. I've been to the border a couple of times and been pretty astounded, astounded by, like, just how bad it's gotten and how many people are coming across, military-age men. This is not going to end well. I mean, if, right. if, if, we, if we are successful and we take control of the executive branch and House and the Senate and we really start doing mass deportations like we need to to save the country – I think things are going to get pretty nasty. Like, I, I don't think it's going to be a walk in the park to to get the country back to where it needs to be. But this is going to be the hard lifting that's going to have to take place. Um, most influential president on your 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 life? Oh, not, my not life, an American of, of my lifetime is definitely President Trump. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, I, I think without uh, without him entering the political scene. I think we'd still basically just have one big uniparty, mm -hmm. you know, every now and again. Like the, the – imagine that the the regime change we would have had in 2016 had Trump not been successful. You know, it would have gone from yeah. like the Bushes to the Obamas and now the Clintons are back. It's right, like right. We, we'd have like this American royalty that would every now and again like change their T-shirt. Right. Um, I think Trump disrupting that 
is probably the most significant thing that's happened in my my lifetime. And, and the fact that he's been able, especially in the last six months, he's been able to really capture the entire Republican Party all over again and say, like, no, these are the things that we stand for, like actually putting our country first. That's where we stand. That's the line in the sand that we're drawing. I think that's incredibly significant. Uh, most important veteran related issue. Uh, I think they're all. I think the big ones are all kind of intertwined in a way that we don't fully understand. That the suicides, the veteran cancer, and you know, for lack of a better term, the PTSD. I, I think there's some lethal cocktail that the medical community hasn't put their finger on, from toxic exposures, from TBI, um, and probably some other factors as well. Just the trauma of combat that's really affecting guys. Um, we just lost our our good friend yeah. Josh to, to cancer. Uh, I just actually found out another support guy who was with Josh and I, he just passed away a year before from a cancer that came out of nowhere. I've lost other friends. So the cancer in the veteran community, especially mm -hmm. guys who did multiple deployments, like that's, that's just something like, yeah. It's, and, yeah it's and, and, and to me, the ones that I've you know personally gone through, it's always been the same story. There's an initial detection, mm -hmm. there's treatment, like a conventional cancer treatment. They get some false hope. They get told you're good. And then a couple months later, they're like, oh, crap, it's everywhere, and you've got six months to live. That's exactly what happened with Josh. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that in, in some ways coupled – like we're seeing the suicides tick back up. Mm -hmm. Marty, Marty just sent me an article from the uh, Army Times this morning about this cab unit that had like six suicides, you know, and like – People will say, well, that's because veterans are going and they're experiencing, you know, combat and that's that's affecting them and then they're killing themselves. And I don't believe that because when we had two surges going on and there was like intense combat in Iraq and Afghanistan, maybe it was happening, but I don't remember veterans offing themselves. Like I don't remember guys coming back and killing themselves. I remember guys coming back and volunteering for more. And, and sure, there was the drinking and there was mm -hmm. a lot of other, you know, not not healthy activities guys would engage in. But there wasn't guys sticking guns in their mouth mm -hmm. every single day like there is right now. And, and, and so I, I I think – and I went to the – before I retired, I went to the, the TBI, NICO mm -hmm. clinic at Walter Reed. And that's one of the – one of the things that really stuck with me. Those, those docs were like, look, we <laughs> – there's so much we don't know about TBI. And we don't – we don't know where like TBI stops and PTSD starts, you know, or right. where the toxic exposures have come in. I, I just think that there's this lethal cocktail – that's kind of been been brewing up inside of veterans that we've really got to wrap our arms around. And the VA is heavily dysfunctional um, in that regard. So, you know, the nonprofits have stepped up and that type of thing. But I, th I think that's the – that that basket of, you know, suicide, PTSD, talk exposure. I think that's, that's something we've got to spend a lot more time, money, and effort on because guys are dying. Um, a piece of advice for guys that are – either just transitioned or transitioning out of the mill how to how to how to keep how to keep their shit together yeah man um you gotta find a new purpose yeah i i think that's um i mean that's tied to what we we're just talking about with the ptsd and stuff i I, th I think a lot of going from an environment where you're around like-minded people all the time and probably doing pretty arduous things that you have a lot of pride in then going to being a regular just another dude in the neighborhood, you know, he's got a, he's got a job somewhere or something. Like, I think it's really easy, um, to say, wow, what's my purpose now? And then especially too, uh, the way that the wars wound down, like, what was it all for? Right. You know, the, the Afghan withdrawal affected a lot of people. Like it yeah. was a gut punch for a lot of people. Same thing a couple of years before in, in Iraq. And I, unfortunately, I think we're gonna have the same thing again when we finally get out of these Middle East wars, if we can ever do that. Um, but you've got to find a community and you got to find a purpose. Um, that's, I mean, especially because I moved away from like a heavily military community, mm. that was challenging for me. So it was, it was, it was, I was very blessed to, you know, meet my wife and then also, you know, find a, a gym, a jujitsu gym that has a bunch of veterans at it, but also just a bunch of guys that are, you know, supportive in the, in the community. I can't imagine having to go it alone, you know, like yeah. just like you move back to some random town right. or no one, you know, and, and just think that you can assimilate right back into, into society. Like I, I, I think humans are, humans are, are very much pack animals. Um, and our society has gotten away from that, but we found that again in the military. And I, I think there was something very primal that we tapped into. And that's why I think a lot of it was so addictive for us. Mm -hmm. And then you get spit back out the other end if you don't plan and you don't actively seek out a community. But then also a purpose too. That's another big thing. Like our purpose in the military was pretty clear. 
You know, like you got very be, defined mission. Get your job. You got to be in shape. You got to <laughs> yeah. shoot. Like it was okay. Cool. It's all cut, it's all cut and dry. But uh, you, you you get out the other side. It's like it's my purpose just to go make money. Like okay, maybe. But I, mean, I think most guys are looking for more than that. Mm-hmm. Like they're looking for like this is my new mission. Um, and there's so many different ways you can do it. Like I've found myself in the, in the political realm. Um, but I think just people getting active somewhere in their community doesn't have to be politics. You know, literally there's so many different veteran services out there that you can go volunteer at. Um, you know, there, there's, there's so much that, that you can do. I think you've just got to find something and say like this, this thing, being a, being a good dad now, uh, being actually on the school board, being mm-hmm. active, being a Boy Scout troop leader, like whatever it is, like that's my new mission and, and I'm going to focus on that. All right. Final thoughts. Anything you'd like to cover before we uh, sign off? <laughs> man, we covered a lot. Uh, you did. I appreciate it, man. Yeah. I, I, uh, no, I appreciate you having me here, and I appreciate everything that uh, that you're doing for the veteran community. And you now I, I hope people uh, get a chance to pick up the book. It's available for for pre order right now. It comes out May seventh. So send me anywhere you buy books. You'll you'll find it there. And I mean, really, the the final thing is just I think people need to really reflect on what it means to be an American. Uh, think really long and hard about that. And to me, the the short answer is being an American is knowing that your debt is never fully paid. Like, yes, we're blessed to have freedom and you can take that for granted. You can just go off and be a free person. But the price of us living in a free society is that you constantly have to be engaged. You constantly have to be earning and you have to, and, and for me, you have to wake up, look at yourself in the mirror and say like, I know that Shannon, I know that so many people who gave their life for this country, I know they're watching. I know there's 13 previous generations who had to go through some sort of struggle. They're watching right now. And what we do next, our kids are going to read about in the history books and we're going to be weighed and measured and judged by history, whether we save the Republic or whether we let it all get squandered away. Can't say it better. Joe, thank you so much. We'll put the uh, link to the book in the title of the podcast uh, as you probably already know. You can uh, follow Joe at uh, Joe Ken for Congress mm-hmm. uh, dot com is the website. If people can donate, greatly appreciated. Mm-hmm. That's how we actually make change. Is we we need small dollar donors. <laughs> uh, and there's links to all my social media cool. on there, primarily on on X. But yeah, Joe Ken for Congress dot com. Great. Thank you guys. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Thank you.